It is 6.30, members of council are assembled and we are ready to begin. Okay, thank you very much then. We'll call to order this committee of the whole meeting of the Council of the Town of Saugeen Shores and welcome all members of the committee and all members of the public who are with us in the gallery this evening and uh, all those who are joining us by the live stream, we're glad that you're all with us. Second item on the agenda is the land acknowledgement and I'll read it this evening. We acknowledge that we are meeting on the traditional lands and treaty territory of the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation, which consists of the Chippewas of Saugeen and the Chippewas of Maywash Unceded First Nation. We understand this land holds immense significance to the people of Saugeen Ojibwe Nation. We appreciate those who live and work alongside us today and who continue the traditions of their ancestors as stewards of the land we are privileged to inhabit. We thank them for the contributions they have made in both caring for the land and in shaping this community. We commit to truth and reconciliation to acknowledging the truth about what happened to Indigenous peoples because of colonization and to reconciliation, which begins with each and every one of us. And there is a sharing moment here, and I just wanted to uh, make note, I was reading in the press um, the about the event that uh, the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation had, or the Saugeen First Nation, I should say, had uh, on the beach in Sable Beach uh, over the weekend, celebrating uh, their successful um, court victory in, um, in um, Winning back control of uh, that uh, of that beach, and I just was I what I saw there was a photo of um, Mayor Gary Mishi and uh, and uh, uh, the chief of the First Nation meeting together, and I, I just thought that was a really great uh, image, and I just uh, it was nice to see the communities coming together beyond the mayor and the chief, the whole community coming together there, and uh, I hope that that's. Uh, indicative of what the future will look like at Sable Beach. And I certainly know that uh, the town of Saugeen Shores is supportive of, of um, both the First Nation and the town of South Bruce Peninsula as they work together to uh, to resolve uh, that issue and to continue reconciliation. As a local government and public organization, we are dedicated to learning about Indigenous culture, to fostering a better relationship with First Nations and their people, and we commit ourselves to actions that move us forward on a path to healing, along with the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation. Okay, so now we'll move on to disclose a pecuniary interest. I'll ask any member if you have one of those, so the Deputy Mayor. Thank you. It's not a disclosure. I just want to make sure that Councillor Stack is part of the record. She's not showing on. Okay, thank you. Okay. So everybody knows Councillor Stack is here and she's making her way on to the screen. Uh, all right, so no disclosure of pecuniary interest. I don't see any. Of course, you can declare one any of one of those anytime if you need to. We have no additions, deletions, or amendments to the agenda. Um, we have no open forum requests tonight, I don't think. No. Uh, so now we're on to delegations, and we have two delegations this evening. I'll just remind our delegations that. Uh, we have allotted 10 minutes for each of our delegations, so we'd appreciate it if you'd uh, stay within those timelines for us. The, um, so the first one uh, is a delegation by Leanne Sinclair, and she's here to talk to us about Menstrual Health Day on May 28th. So uh, Ms. Sinclair, when you're ready, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. I'd like to start off by just saying thank you to Mayor Charbonneau and the councils of the town of Saugeen Shores for taking the time to listen and talk about Menstrual Health Day. And a special thank you to Councillor Davinsky for um, supporting this delegation this evening. I would like to just start by talking about menstrual what Menstrual Health Day is. It was initiated by the German nonprofit WASH United in 2014. Menstrual Health Day is a global day of action with more than 830 partner organizations worldwide. And working together, they catalyze awareness and action towards a world without period poverty and stigma. The, the, date, um, the date of Menstrual Health Day is May 28th. So you may say why that particular date was chosen. It was chosen because it represents the 28 represents the menstrual cycle of average of 28 days. And the fifth month, which is May, is the average length of time of a cycle, which is five days. Um, today, millions of menstruators around the world are stigmatized, excluded, and discriminated against because they menstruate. Menstrual Health Day um, begins with talking. So it's a time to speak positively about periods and by talking about them, then we can help end the stigma around them. Often it is not something that's talked about 
uh, hasn't been in years and maybe not talked about in mis mixed company. So it's definitely a great step that I'm here that you're willing to listen to me talk about it today. Also by talking about periods, we can raise awareness about the challenges that marginalized communities experience and begin the discussion around access to free period products and increasingly education around periods. If you think about when you go to a food bank, what is it the first thing that comes to mind that you're gonna donate? You're gonna donate food, obviously, pasta, uh, soup, um, maybe then you extend it and you think of baby products, diapers, um, et cetera. And you may extend it into other hygiene products, soap, but do you ever think about period products? So that's something by talking about it, maybe you'll think about next time I go to the food bank, I make a donation. I'm also going to throw in a pad, a box of pads, a box of tampons or something. So that's available to people. If you are marginalizing and you are on a limited income, if you have to feed your family, you're going to spend time buying food. You're going to spend your money on food. You're not going to spend your money on period products. And as a menstruator, if you don't have the products available, then you may not go to be able to go to work for a day or two days. And that does have a direct impact on the efficiency of a workplace. So those are the things by talking about them, we can remove that stigma. The Period Purse, just talk a little bit about the organization I'm involved with, is a nonprofit registered charity. It launched in Toronto in 2017. The Period Purse creates menstrual equity by ensuring sustainable access to period products for all and by ending the stigma associated with periods through education and advocacy, such as Menstrual Health Day. In 2021 and 2022, the Period Purse um, did have a chapter, a very successful chapter in the town of Saugeen Shores and, over, and did two very successful um, product drives, donation drives. And they were able to donate over 5,000 products to local um, organizations. Now our chapter program is, has now ended, but we do still encourage people to run drives so that they can donate to their local organizations and we're able to assist with that. So in summary, I'd like to request the town of Saugeen Shores to proclaim May 28th, 2023 as Menstrual Health Day and to join communities across Canada in recognizing this issue and to help keep the conversation going. And that's all I had to say. So thank you very much for your time. Well, thank you very much. And I'll ask uh, members if they have any questions or comments for Ms. Sinclair. Councillor Stack. So first, thank you for the presentation. Um, I wanted to also just recognize the use of inclusive language. I thought that was really great. I read that in the presentation. It was good to hear that um, again here today. I know it's still very much sort of a moving target, but I think that was great. And just um, obviously, as a woman, I um, I support this and would support any effort to claim it as uh, Menstrual Health Day on the 28th. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Are there further questions or comments? Councillor Kavinsky. Yes, thank you, Leanne. Leanne's a friend of mine. And um, when she asked about this, the initial was that I do a notice of motion, but it just wasn't going to work out that way. I'd rather have the person there and Leanne has stepped up to the plate and has indeed uh, said what everybody should be thinking if they do not talk about it. Um, Leanne, how has the program worked? You said it worked very successfully in Saki Shores. Is it working successfully elsewhere? I know there was a big push a while back on getting free menstrual products in our schools. So that program um, does still there. It is supported. I believe it's supported by Shoppers Drug Mart. And there are a limited amount of products, period products available in high schools. I don't believe they're available in, in public schools. Um, that's one of the programs that we do as well through the period product 
period purses, we do work on donations to schools. Um, the federal government has just announced the requirement for federally regulated organizations to provide free period products um, for their organizations across the country. So anything that is federally regulated. Um, one example, the city of Mississauga, they do have period products available for free in 100 of their community facilities. So community centers, um, the city hall as well. So they have those, they actually have dispensers. They're very, uh, I, I, they're quite impressive to see. Um, and there are a variety, I think the city of London, um, city of Toronto does not provide them free, but they have a, a separate budget item for their shelter program. So most shelters have a, pro, a budget item for hygiene products, which includes everything, soap, shampoo, toilet paper. But the city of Toronto has created a separate um, budget item specifically for period products for their shelter programs. Does that answer your question, Mr. Councillor Davinsky? Yes, thank you. And Mr. Mayor, I hope the people that are watching and listening will think about this the next time they go out shopping. You know, these products could be donated to the women's houses that we have in Owen Sound and in King Carden. And uh, that would go a long way towards uh, servicing those people that uh, haven't been recognized as much as they should be. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. No, thank you, the Deputy Mayor. Thank you, and through you, um, thank you, Leanne, for the presentation. Um, a couple of years ago, I remember uh, the service called I Belong to the Chantry Island Shambats. We went out and, and purchased quite a large supply and coincidentally ended up at Shoppers Drug Mart um, and they doubled our, our purchases. So um, those, those products went to uh, four local food banks and, and I know they were very well received. It's a, it's a wonderful program. Um, even if there's not a local chapter, I hope um, people sort of uh, pick up on some of the messaging about um, adding to their donations to various various charities. You've asked for something that um, the timeline is so tight. I, I'm not positive that that's going to be possible. However, um, is there any possibility for any messaging on the town's say, Facebook page coming up on May the 20th, 28th, which might replicate a bit of the presentation and just, you know, recognize that this delegation happened. I'm not too sure how we, we do a designated day thing, perhaps if you could enlighten us, but I, sure. I think the time's too short here. Yeah, certainly uh, it wouldn't, it would be difficult for council to do it. I mean, I, unless there was objection, I could do it um, myself. Uh, I'd certainly be willing to do that. Um, and we could issue a statement. I think it's a perfectly appropriate thing to recognize uh, May 28th uh, uh, in response to uh, Ms. Sinclair's request this evening. And I think the municipality can certainly put together um, a statement in support of Menstrual Health Day. Um, I think beyond that, um, one thing that I, I think uh, as we approach the 2024 budget, uh, we should be considering um, menstrual products in uh, public facilities municipal facilities. I think I'd like council to have that conversation. My guess is that's probably on the scale of our budget, a relatively small thing to do. Um, and I think it's something we could do. And I think it's high time we did do it. So, um, so I think, uh, um, you know, looking out at our corporate, at our staff, uh, community services staff, I think that's something we'll see come back for discussion in the 2024 budget and that uh, we can carry that conversation forward. So I really appreciate uh, Leanne, you coming in this evening and putting this uh, before us, uh, and I think uh, you know it is a, it is a, a, you know a, to be perfectly blunt, a bit of a taboo subject. It has been right, and it's important that it not be that way, and that we have these conversations. This is something that uh, half of our, fully half of the population experiences, and it's something that we should. It shouldn't be a, a stigma. It should be something that we uh, talk about, and we provide the supports, particularly those who are in need. Um, of support, uh, and uh, I think the municipality is in a position to do some work on that front. So I really do thank you for bringing it to our attention, and uh, and as I say, we'll work on um, on recognizing the day as well, and and more to follow on that. So thank you very much, Leanne. We really appreciate you coming in tonight. 
Thank you very much. I appreciate the time and um, the information you're going to talk about for next year's budget is really exciting to me. So thanks so much for really recognizing and taking the initiative on that. Thank you. All right. Well, have a good evening. Thank you very much. So now we're going to move on to our second delegation, which is from uh, Linda Dahl, and she's here to talk to us uh, about the proposed designation for St. Andrew's Presbyterian Church. Ms. Dahl is there, and hopefully we can get your mic turned on there, and and maybe uh, can we get Leanne's uh, video, Leanne, sorry, uh, Linda's video up and running there. <clears throat> Good evening. Um, I'd like to thank um, thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak to you about St. Andrew's Presbyterian Church. In my role as the clerk of session, um, I'm able to speak to you on behalf of the church and the congregation. Um, the next slide. Um, as you can see on the map here, <clears throat> the yellow line is Highway 21, which is Albert Street North. That's heading towards the river there. And the green line is the main uh, street of Southampton and the white box there is where St. Andrew's Church is located. And the next, the Ontario Heritage, Heritage Act with its new regulations has nine criteria, which are listed under three evaluation categories. And they are design value, historical value or associative value and contextual value. A building only needs to satisfy any two of the nine criteria to be designated. I'm happy to say that our church building satisfies not two, but five of the nine criteria. So I will now focus on the five criteria that are most relevant in this case. Under design value, St. Andrew satisfies the first criteria because it, it is representative of Gothic revival style. This style was most popular was the most popular style for 19th century churches in Ontario. Comparing an early photograph of the building with one taken last month, we can see that the main characteristics of Gothic revival style survive in the rectangular box form, the gabled roof, and the paired lancet windows. These architectural features were retained when the building was expanded in 1911 to include two Norman towers and a large decorative window with a pointed arch centered on the facade. St. Andrew satisfies the second relevant criteria because it was found to have a direct association with an event, belief, persons, and an institution. <clears throat> the historical event is founded, it is the founding and early settlement of Southampton. Captain John Spence arrived in 1848. He brought his family here to stay and he became a trustee of the church. In the 1851 census, most villagers identified themselves as Presbyterians. <clears throat> St. Andrews also has an historical association with persons of stature and accomplishment in the community. And that's the next slide there. <clears throat> Some of them held political office, while others were master mariners and others were entrepreneurs. All of these notable persons contributed their time and service to the congregation of St. Andrew's Church. In pioneer days especially, the church was an essential institution in the life of the community. It's interesting to read the historian Norman Robertson on this point, quote, no item in connection with the early history of Southampton has been related in the public press more frequently or with more detail than the starting of the Presbyterian congregation there. And the next slide. <clears throat> in August 1851, Crown Land Agent Alexander McNabb arrived with his family and with his nephew, a minister, who preached the first sermon in the village. Within a year, they built a log cabin church on High Street, and the map on the right shows that location, which is now where the Lighthouse Restaurant sits. Next slide. 
A third relevant criteria under historical associative value concerns the educational aspects of the building. If a picture is worth a thousand words, this building is worth millions more. St. Andrews informs the viewer of a time in history prior to modernist design. The cornerstones document three stages of community effort and construction, and they are 1862, 1887, and 1911. Built in 1862, St. Andrews is Southampton's oldest building still being used as a church. Belonging to that special historical historic category of pre-Confederation buildings, it contributes to the authenticity of the character of Southampton as the oldest port on the Bruce coast. For people driving into Southampton on Highway 21, St. Andrew's front towers are visually aligned with the clock tower of the former Southampton Town Hall on High Street. They are a visual cue to our downtown. It is also historically linked to the former Village Hall or the Masonic Hall, which is right across the street from uh, the church on 38 Albert Street North, where church services were held there in 1861. And it is visually linked to other historic buildings on Albert Street North. And these are just a few of them. The pictures there. And that's fine. <clears throat> I trust that we have shown that by satisfying five criteria, St. Andrews exceeds by far the two criteria that are required under the new regulations, and it is therefore well deserving of a heritage designation. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. I will ask if there's questions or comments from members of the committee. Councillor Grace. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, Linda, and thank you to uh, the St. Andrews community and congregation for the immense amount of work, um, meticulous preparation, and the presentation that you gave us tonight. Um, this report, uh, you know, if you read the entire thing, uh, which is lengthier than this, um, details the important cultural, historical, and architectural characteristics of St. Andrews. Um, and that underlines its significance as uh, in the cultural fabric of Southampton and Saugeen Shores. Um, but we also know uh, besides this designation, historical heritage designation, the importance of the contributions that St. Andrews has made to the community through the years, all of the, uh, you know, the ministering, the pastoral work, the community support. Um, it's all so important and it lives on in the legacy of this fine, beautiful building. So thank you for all your work. Um, and it's really gratifying to see that hopefully we will have uh, another building designated uh, as a heritage building in Saugeen Shores. Thank you. Any questions or comments? Council Mayette. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mayor Charbonneau and uh, Linda. Thanks so much for your presentation and uh, and you, Cheryl, for the you know the Heritage Committee for all the great work the Heritage Committee is doing. And I know you put a lot of work into this, Linda. And anything we can do to protect our heritage, in this case, the church. Uh, it's a wonderful initiative and, and good for you. I served on the Heritage Committee for a good number of years and and uh, I know the committee continues to do good work and looks for initiatives like this, you know, where we can uh, protect our heritage. And uh, so that heritage designation, I hope it's uh, fruitful. I hope, hope you succeed and and uh, stay the course. And again, thank you to you and, and all of the members of the church for, for helping to, good to see you, Grace, uh, for helping to make this happen. So. Great work. Yeah. Councilor Mayette. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And through you, um, great work, and I certainly will support this. This is a lovely building. I've been by there many times, um, and I appreciate the historical work that you put into the research. Uh, the one part that I was wondering is, is what is the significance of St. Andrew? Is there a tie to, I, I'm not sure what St. Andrew why he was made a saint. I think it's 
but he was an important <laughs> guy apparently. And I, I'm, when I think of St. Andrew, I think of the golf course over in Scotland. And uh, <laughs> I'm not sure if there's a sister church in Scotland that he was, this was named after. Is there any, any significant significance to that? Oh, okay. Yeah, I guess St. Andrew is a Scottish saint. So when many Presbyterians immigrated from Scotland. And, okay. um, Apparently he was settled. a golfer too. I guess, yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, All right. So then there's no significance other than that's just the name that was chosen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. But yes, we will support this, I'm sure. Thank you. Thank you. Further comments? Yeah, well, I just echo my colleagues. Thanks so much for all the work that you've done. It's a beautiful building and one that's well worth designation. I might point out too, it's great, um, you know, and the way that this this works and the way it works well is when the owner of the property comes and initiates this protest with council it makes it an easier makes it an easy uh win an easy uh, project to achieve a designation on so i really appreciate your willingness and the congregation's willingness and it's not a small thing it should be noted you know it requires once once a property is designated and those elements are identified under the act then it requires the property owner to maintain those elements uh and uh, and that uh, that's a commitment you know from from you and from your from the rest of your congregation so i just really appreciate what the statement that you're making by pursuing this designation, uh, because you know what you're saying is you're going to preserve it, and I know the people of Southampton and of all of Saugeen Shores will be quite grateful to hear that that's your intent. So, so thanks very much, uh, and uh, please pass along our thanks to your whole congregation, and we'll look forward to there's a process to get this done. So uh, we're going to have a conversation later on tonight about getting that process started. So thanks very much for your time tonight, and have a good evening. Okay, so we're moving on then to um, item eight report of municipal officers and committees, several uh, reports in there this evening. The first one is uh, about a partnership with the Society of United Professionals and we'll turn that over to the manager of strategic initiatives. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, this is really a good news story. The Society of United Professionals have supported physician recruitment in Sogging Shores since 2014 through an investment of two condos in Southampton. The condos are leased to the town for $1 annually to accommodate visiting physicians, whether they are residents in training, locums, or are covering hospital emergency room and, um, and family clinics. The interactions visiting physicians have with the community, the hospital system, the local physician network often leads to recruitment of these physicians to our community. So the report speaks to two documents. One is a memorandum of understanding. The reason behind that is really to solidify the partnership that the town has with the Society of United Professionals um, and our mutual goal towards physician recruitment. And additionally, the lease for Condo 5 is up for renewal. With that, uh, if you have any questions, happy to thank you. So, there is a recommendation that council adopt a bylaw to authorize a memorandum of understanding with the Society of United Professionals, Bruce Local, and the council adopt a bylaw to authorize a lease agreement with the Society of United Professionals for the Morpeth Street Condo 5 in Southampton. Questions or comments from members? Start with council, oh, the vice deputy mayor, and then Councilor Grace. Yeah, thanks for all your good work, Jill, and uh, just to the Society of United Professionals, you know, I one of the first groups we approached with Lamont Sports Park, you know, it's the Society of United Professionals. And they stepped right up to the plate and made a significant contribution. And they do so much for our community. And and uh, these two condos, you talk about 250 doctors over the last eight years. That's, I mean, that's, that's significant, those doctors using the condos. So it's really important that uh, those those facilities are available to our community to house those doctors and, and uh, you know, good good for the society. You know, I think this is a, a good memorandum and and I hope, Mr. Mayor, that uh, a thank you letter uh, as well would be sent uh, on behalf of council. Uh, Mr. Mayor, if I could ask for that. I think it's very important to let them know that we really do appreciate what they're doing, Jill. And uh, they're, a, they're a solid group for our community, do a lot for our community. So thanks. And just in response to that, I think you'll see in the memorandum of understanding, there's some language around ongoing recognition uh, uh, for society. I think uh, with this partnership has existed for a very long period of time, and I think we went too long during the last period without sort of recognizing again and repeatedly that contribution. So I think that's a mistake we're not going to make again, that we're we're going to continue to and maybe even uh, on, a, on a frequent basis, uh, make sure to remind the public of this great contribution from society. I don't know, Jet, do you have any 
comments, Jill, to how that how we might be doing that. To make sure to turn your mic on, Jill. I turned it to the left. Um, yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you, we um, one of the reasons that we formulated this memorandum of understanding was so that we did, you know, so it was right in front of us that we do do a regular um, recognition of this considerable investment that they make, um, uh, and so we will be uh, rolling that out, you know, in the coming months and and often and regular. And I think a letter is a great idea to start that. Yep, absolutely. We can do that. Thank you, Councillor Grace. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. It's been said before, but I also want to thank the society for this incredibly generous uh, support. Uh, it's it's so important uh, for our medical community, uh, for our physician recruitment effort, and um, we're very, very lucky to have this opportunity. Thank you. Absolutely. Council Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you. Um, yeah, just to reiterate the the recognition piece, I think this has been before council, I believe, in the last term. What's the term of the last agreement? Was it a four year term? Yeah, the the leases are every five years. Every, so, so you, five you probably term. saw. I think the last one was in twenty nineteen. Okay. There's two was, condos, so you would have seen agreements coming through for both those condos. Right, and and I remember at that time I we talked about recognition, and I I'd requested or suggested maybe that. Um, inside the condo like on the back of the door or something there'd be a plaque that says these condos were donated or are owned and operated by the town but on behalf of the society of the united professionals so that when those doctors are here on locum they know that it's not just the town of soggy insurer that it, the ownership is actually with those the united professionals and and furthermore you said 2014 i'm, I'm pretty sure that these this condo arrangement predates that because I retired at the end of 2014 and this was well before that I know Rob Stanley who was the vice president of uh, finance and I was the vice president of the Bruce local for a number of years just before I retired too and uh, and this predates that by probably up to a decade after that this was this was an, a, a unique initiative that the society of at that time energy professionals proposed with the equity share of Bruce Power that they uh, they got when Bruce Power was formed, and so I, I, it does go back a little further than 2014. But and we also did it in during my term. We we purchased a couple of properties in Picardie for the same purpose as that. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, it, it's not just here, but across the region. So mm -hmm. Kudos to them for keeping this up. Yeah, yeah. Through you, Mr. Mayor, just one point: uh, we do have plaques in both condos that do recognize their contributions. Yep, we put that up uh, last year. Yeah, a few of us were there when it, when we cut the ribbon on it. Uh, Jill, when her previous stint with the Town of Sogging Shores before this one, and probably the Deputy Mayor was there as well, and that was back in uh, 2007 or 8, something like that, I would guess. Um, but anyway, yeah, further comments or questions? Seeing none, all right, so you've heard the recommendation, and all in favor? That's carried. Okay, now we're on to item uh, two, which is the first quarter 2023 variance to budget report and the Treasurer. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. The first quarter variance to budget report gives a summary of the corporation's financial operating results through the first quarter of 2023. The results are tracking reasonably close to budget with an expected budget surplus of approximately 0.3 million, primarily composed of labor surpluses from new positions that have not yet been filled and other vacant positions. I'm happy to take any questions on the report. Thank you, questions or comments? don't see any so the recommendation is that council receive the first quarter 2023 variance to budget report for information all in favor that's carried okay so now we're on to item three which is the development charges bylaw amendment and we have uh, what do we have the manager is it the manager of uh, Not yet. That coming up <laughs> i appreciate that well uh, we're gonna we'll promote you early <laughs> Tell uh, people who pay. For, not, but, for today, the supervisor development services going to be managed. Thank you. Uh, you know, this is a uh, you know a reminder. You know, this uh, back in April, uh, we uh, we held the public meeting on the development charges background study. Uh, at the meeting, we heard um, uh, comments to, from council re related to con 
considering dividing the share of DCs between residential and non-residential shares. And a second comment is that if DCs are to be increased, consider de delaying implementation or deferring implementation. The report outlines uh, you know, our analysis to those two questions and doesn't recommend proceeding with any further changes to the study. Um, so ultimately we recommend the amending uh, background study and the, uh, the draft amending bylaw be approved. Okay, so there is a recommendation that Council approve the updated development charges background study and that the development charges bylaw be adopted to authorize the development charges in accordance with the Development Charges Act. Uh, probably could have put development charges in there one more time. Don't you think? <laughs> yes. Are there uh, questions or comments? The Deputy Mayor. Thank you. And through you, um, the explanation you just gave, Jay, was um, very straightforward. Um, there. There were, I had some questions from members of the public. The trigger for this was related to um, adjusting the values attached to the DC charges, um, particularly related to the aquatic center. Is that is that a fair statement? Is that what triggered this or was there something else that, because that, I don't think it's the right time for the big review. When When is that? No, that's correct. I mean, the, we just updated, uh, I think it was a year and a half ago, maybe we were approaching two years with the last update. Uh, certainly updating the bylaw is required every five years. The legislation's changed, so it's now every 10 years. But we chose to do this following discussion related to the Aquatic Centre to optimize the revenue potential through growth and to make sure it was you know, collected sooner rather than deferring collection till later. So, yes. So um, thank you and through you. So any monetary change to the values um, associated with different kinds of builds um, is directly related to um, the, the planned aquatic center. That was the question that I got. Is it, was anything else sort of fit in there or the, the increases relate specifically to recreation, specifically aquatics? <laughs> Yeah, correct. It's it's indoor recreation. So the DC background study, the overall, you know, looks at about you know half a dozen or six to eight categories. Indoor rec is one of them, and in the indoor recreation category, the major project is the aquatic center. So uh, any you know an increase as a result of this amending bylaw is related directly and only uh, to the aquatic center project. Thank you very much. Okay. Further questions or comments. Seeing none, you've heard the recommendation, then all in favor. That's carried. Okay, so now we're on to item four, which is uh, the Aquatics and Wellness Center site plan. And I see the Supervisor of Development Services and perhaps the Director of Community Service. We're good. So we'll go to the Supervisor of Development Services. Yes, thank you. I'll introduce this. Um, and, uh, you know, Director Schreider's on, uh, of course, uh, as well as our consulting team uh, through Salter Pilon uh, Let and uh, you know, I, I'm never quite sure the names they can introduce themselves or remind us who they are. But uh, following uh, from, you know, the December meeting in which the aquatics was sort of the major last time this was presented, the design and review teams have been refining the project to remain under budget while delivering on the key elements of the project related to the pool, walking, fitness, community hub, workplace 2.0. We wanted also to make sure high quality design was still at the forefront and that there was effective integration in the existing context while the arena and the office work still had to proceed. So uh, before I turn it over uh, it, to the consulting team to give additional details and an overview of the changes to the project, uh, I want to draw your attention to the parts of the report and the site that, that shows the way, many ways this project enhances the site. Uh, you, know, to, uh, you know, the site at uh, 600 Tomlinson Drive and makes it worthy of being the focus of community life. And so, you know, drawing your attention to landscaping and site amenities. Uh, and because the site is becoming more and more a focus of community life, the amenities that support long-term use and enjoyment of the area are being provided. So in addition to the meeting requirements or meeting the requirements for vehicular parking, the site provides safe and secure access for the pedestrians and cyclists. Bike racks and the future uh, location for bike, a bike parking shelter. And that's, uh, you know, in this, you know, sort of uh, area between the Nuclear Innovation Institute and the um, 
the BMX park uh, are being provided to ensure users of the site can securely stow and use bikes at the site. Uh, there are uh, sidewalks and markings to that adorn the site at appropriate widths to ensure safe movement for all users. Uh, there are future opportunities for benches with shade areas, gathering places, plazas, and other outdoor gathering and seating areas to offer quiet respite. Um, you know, something that is uh, near and dear to this council and many previous councils are is related to the actual amount of landscape open space tree retention and green space. And th this plan is no different. It emphasizes the preservation retention of healthy trees as much as possible. In fact, only 20, uh, it says 29 in the report. Since this was published, we've been able to refine that only 25 are, are proposed to be removed. But during the restoration and development of the site, more than 100 new trees, nearly 300 shrubs, bushes, and over 100 grasses and perennials offer numerous species and visual variety. There's even a location for a holiday tree uh, for seasonal gatherings. Um, it's important because this is an existing site and there's many uh, residences nearby that screening and buffering, uh, especially to the lands to the either the south is maintained or enhanced where possible. Uh, and I guess, if I may, I'm not sure if it's Michael that's presenting. I'll just turn it over to him because the majority of uh, what he's presenting is a visual thing and he can guide you through that. So thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Jay. And uh, thank you, Council, for your time tonight. I'm just going to share my screen. And looking for a thumbs up if everyone is able to see this. Okay. Uh, so Ryan Stitt and I are here tonight to uh, to walk you through the update of your Aquatics and Wellness Center. Um, we're going to talk a bit about the project history, which most of you know, but we'll summarize it again uh, and uh, update since our last presentation in December, some of the design considerations uh, then and now. And then Ryan's going to walk us through uh, the latest design. We'll circle back on some of the sustainable solutions that we discussed back in December and then uh, our next steps. So a project overview. As you know, um, this project was envisioned since the recreational master plan back in 2016. Um, since then the pool location was completed in 2017 and the request for proposals for prime consulting services was issued in March of last year. And um, our, our, since then our construction manager, Ball Construction has also joined the team. We, uh, we did a number of uh, extensive stakeholder and public engagement processes, uh, which was presented to council in September. And again, uh, reiterated in December, the results of the engagement process focused on uh, project values, which were defined as community focused, operational savings and sustainability. Those are the values that uh, have been framing uh, our design uh, ever since those engagement sessions occurred. Um, the, the project team came uh, before council um, back in uh, September. And uh, at that time, there was an increase in uh, some of the program areas. The six lanes turned to eight lanes in the natatorium. Um, we looked at the increase in the size of the track and there was a selection of the actual site at that time in terms of where it'd be situated on site. And uh, we came back to council in December um, at that time, we looked at uh, increasing the construction budget for the project to 49.25 million. Um, we flagged a number of quote unquote premium items that um, if budget permitted, we would incorporate into the design. We're gonna walk through those with you here tonight. Um, and then uh, there was also the inclusion and consideration of workplace 2.0 expanded town hall component um, as well as council chambers. So some design considerations uh, as we've been working through this process. Um, considerations that have been made. So obviously we're focusing on operational costs and sustainability as those were the values that were, were um, presented. We're also looking at uh, additional on-street or on-site parking based on the public feedback and the programming demands. I'll speak to that in a bit more detail in a future slide. 
Um, we also know that there is uh, a future ice pad to be added, a second ice pad to the site. So we need to anticipate and work with that. I'll, I'll talk to that briefly coming up as well. Um, Jay had mentioned some of the site amenities that are anchoring this as a, as a community space, uh, not just within the building, but outside of it. Uh, so that's been a constant and um, updates will be shown here shortly. Um, opportunities to address the current town hall constraints have been considered and that includes municipal office space and as well as council chambers. So this is the latest site plan. Um, it proposes an additional 167 parking spaces, as well as um, a dedicated drop-off pickup bus loading zone at the south entrance of the building. In total, there's 411 parking spaces altogether. And uh, when we get to the slide, which will show you how your second rink will, will dovetail in, there would be a reduction of 40 parking spaces in that uh, at that time. Although there are there has been space allocated on the site to make up for those parking spaces um, when that does come to pass. Entrances to the site remain as they did back in December. So there are uh, the existing entrances off Tomlinson, which will remain. And there's a new entrance located off of Wellington Street. Uh, for simple graphics, oh, I got ahead of myself here, sorry. For simple graphics, everything in red is your existing building. Everything in blue is your new aquatics and wellness center. Um, this slide kind of gives you a sense of the scale of the, the, of the new building relative to the space that many of you are sitting in, or most of you I think are sitting in tonight. The main entrance will remain um, as it is in its current location, and there will be a new secondary entrance on the south side of the building adjacent to that uh, pickup drop off um, dedicated bus loading area on the south side. We had mentioned uh, there needed to be some consideration for a future ice pad um, that has been considered in the design and Lo and behold, it fits perfectly between uh, the two buildings, go figure. Um, it's a mirror image of your, of your current ice pad. Um, and so that has been accommodated. Um, we'll be speaking shortly about uh, some, of the, some of the changes that have happened since we presented in December, one of which was uh, um, a higher water table than originally anticipated. And so as a result of that, we're raising the finished floor elevation of your new building uh, by 1.7 meters. Um, and Ryan's going to walk us through what that looks like on the interior. But when we're speaking specific to your future ice pad, there's obviously going to be considerations about the foundations and anticipating that uh, construction. But it also means that from your new building, you'll be able to look onto the ice kind of above the, the edge of the boards. Um, which will give you a dominant view down onto that future pad, um, which will be a great thing when that happens. Jay was mentioning uh, about outdoor amenity spaces. Um, these were presented as uh, premium quote unquote items in the previous round. Um, and so we are building the infrastructure in anticipation of more outdoor spaces, but in the current budget, we're building the civic square in front of your current plex. Um, albeit there will be some portions of that project, like any water that'll be uh, phased in, budget permitting. Um, there will be outdoor programming spaces off of multi-purpose rooms. Um, and so that gives this building the opportunity for summer camps and programming that uh, I'm sure will use that outdoor amenity space. We are reusing a lot of the existing asphalt. Um, there you have existing parking spaces. There's no reason to spend the money to tear it up just to put more asphalt down. And so we're working as best we can with the infrastructure that you already have. Um, the Civic Square, we did talk about some of the uh, placemaking elements um, such as the, the water feature and public art would be phased and added in at a later point, but the base infrastructure is there. Um, we are building the base infrastructure for your site amenities as well. Um, and the addition of the, 
of the parking as noted. And with that, I'll hand it over to Ryan, who's going to uh, walk us through uh, updates to your new building. That's great. Thanks, Mike. And good evening, Council. Uh, so we'll walk through um, the updated design of where our current design sits for the Aquatic Center. Uh, so we'll start with some exterior imagery here. Uh, the first being some elevations of the uh, addition that we're going to um, add to the existing plex. Um, so from here, these are the north elevations. Uh, so from the existing uh, main entrance side of the building, um, the lower image, you can see uh, the overall elevation of the existing building on the right hand side. Uh, and in the uh, dash box, you can see the new elevation, which is the um, the areas where Mike was talking about with regards to multi-purpose spaces, uh, kind of centralized in the middle of the building. And then on the uh, left-hand side is the area of the natatorium and the aquatic uh, facility as well. Uh, the upper image is just a blow up of this area. Uh, so, you know, gaining some future materials in that central stairwell uh, while also providing uh, the large glazing across the north side of the natatorium. Um, this image uh, doesn't depict it perfectly, but this one does, is that we also are looking at a sloped roof on this side of the building uh, to tie back in uh, to the existing geometries of the existing plex as well, uh, knowing that the sloped roofs there have a prominent feature in the overall uh, design and form of that building. Uh, so this image is looking into the natatorium on that north side of the building. Uh, looking at the south side of the building, so the south side of the building really does focus in on the uh, the fitness uh, and the gymnasium and uh, wellness side of the building. Uh, so again, on the lower image there, we have our overall elevation uh, showing uh, kind of how this ties in. There really isn't a direct tie in at the south side, um, but on um, at really at the link condition, uh, which is further back in the central portion of the lower image. And then on the upper image, um, you can see that we've also um, brought in some design features that really provide uh, some uh, opportunities for uh, naming conventions and signage for the building. Uh, so the large area that you can see there that says Soggy and Shores Aquatic and Wellness Center uh, has those opportunities uh, and integrated into that glazed facade uh, looking into the Wellness Center and the gymnasium. And then on the very uh, left-hand side of the upper image is our front entrance uh, on the south side of the building uh, into the wellness center as well. And here's a rendering to depict that. Um, you know, there are some cues within the design here, um, breaking a material to kind of uh, pull down the mass and the size of the building, uh, knowing that this is quite a large facility, um, but also giving it kind of that human uh, element and scale as well. Uh, for people that are walking into the, the building. A few other things just to note uh, with looking at the exterior elevations is uh, working with our construction manager and focused on the budget. Um, we've made some area reductions in the overall quantity of glazing, knowing that there's a premium for the glazing as opposed to uh, kind of a, a solid um, cladding. And so we've been working on, on focusing the glazing specifically where you need it. So it's right sizing the amount of glazing on the, the overall perimeter to, to help to reduce some of the costs. Um, the other piece just to note in reference to this particular image is that uh, the volume of the building that's over the gym and the track are, uh, are a pre-end structure as opposed to um, a, a steel structure. And so there's some cost savings going that route, which is another um, benefit that came about as a result of uh, working with our construction management partners since December. Thanks, Mike. All right, so back to some simple kind of graphics here, looking at this image here uh, in the dark blue, uh, we're showing the area of the new uh, aquatic and wellness center. And then in the area in the red is the renovation area that we're proposing as well within the design uh, that really does kind of become that link portion um, coming from the existing plex uh, into the new facility as well. We have found some opportunities to um, be more efficient with our, with our budget in this area. Ryan was mentioning the renovation, the previous um, presentation at council had a much uh, larger renovation area. And so working with staff, we're, we're still 
working through the details of Workplace 2.0, but the intent here is to um, limit the amount of renovation of the existing town hall um, in order to put more of the, the budget into the Aquatics and Wellness Center project. So we'll dive into some of the greater spaces and the large program areas. Uh, we'll walk you through the overall um, floor plans of the building here. So starting with the aquatic uh, side of the building and the, the natatorium and viewing areas. So the natatorium uh, brings us our two pools. So it brings us our, our lane pool, our lap pool, and our leisure pool as well. Uh, both of these pools are fully accessible uh, with ramps um, into them. Uh, so this is an eight lane pool. Um, as mentioned, it was a six lane pool early on in design. Uh, and then the decision was made to bring this to an eight lane competition pool uh, in this area. Looking at the gymnasium, so the gymnasium in the uh, wellness side of the, of the facility, uh, it does provide us with a full size basketball court, uh, two courts for volleyball, and it will expand for eight courts of uh, pickleball as well. Uh, knowing that pickleball is kind of a, a, a big trend right now and pushing in the community. The next highlighted area here is the multi-purpose rooms. Uh, so the multi-purpose rooms are adjacent to the link back to the existing plex. Uh, as Mike was mentioning, these areas have the ability to have uh, direct access to the outdoors uh, and spill out into that outdoor activity area on the north side of the building. Uh, again, uh, thinking of, of programming uh, with camps and other activities that would be happening in those spaces as well. Uh, the next space here is the fitness studio. So the fitness studio is directly adjacent uh, to the conditioning and to the uh, wellness side of the building. Um, this room does have uh, full views to the outside uh, landscape as well and into the uh, conditioning and the wellness side of the building. Um, this room has kind of been uh, talked about in, in many facets, but it really does uh, provide itself in the sense of a multi-purpose space. Um, that allows for multiple uh, different activities to be happening within that fitness component of the project. And below the fitness is the conditioning center. Uh, so the conditioning center um, located on the east side of the building uh, has direct views uh, to the outside uh, as well. Um, this area would be our main area for all equipment um, in that conditioning sense. Uh, it's located under a uh, lower roof than the high roof above the uh, the gym space and the track uh, to provide a little bit more of, uh, of an intimate or kind of a uh, contained space um, that provides that flexibility, but also allows it to be a little bit more at that human scale for individuals uh, using the equipment in that space. Uh, the next item we're looking at here is the track. Uh, so this is a three lane track. Uh, we did have this noted as a four lane track previously, um, and it was considered in the design at one point. Um, the revision to a three lane track uh, directly came from the understanding that um, we changed the shape of this track with the understanding that this wouldn't necessarily be a competition running track. And we wanted to provide kind of that um, medium between uh, a running track and a walking track as well. So walking tracks, uh, you'll typically see them at two lanes. Um, we have expanded this to three lanes to provide that running lane on the, um, on the track, as well as a walking lane. And then a third lane would be kind of considered that passing lane within the middle. And this was also ultimately out of an understanding of cost savings for the project uh, to bring the overall area um, and the form of the building down to a size and shape that would support the pre-end structure. Um, as Mike mentioned, is one of those cost saving exercises in this area. Uh, noted here in the middle is our offices. So the offices are directly adjacent on that north-south corridor and off of the vestibule for the wellness center as well. Uh, so this is where the main uh, office is supporting the rec functions of the building will be located. And in the bottom uh, left-hand corner is our large um, open reception area, uh, welcoming to the front door and providing that uh, security perspective uh, to the north side of the facility or into the existing plex, and then also to the, uh, the change rooms, which we'll talk about uh, next. So our change rooms are located uh, directly um, behind the, uh, the reception desk. 
and down the corridor uh, north of the track and the, uh, the fitness facility. And so in this area, we have our change rooms uh, that are dedicated uh, to uh, male and female, but also universal washrooms as well and change rooms uh, in those principles. Uh, so the, the layouts and the configuration of these were also well developed through the consultation process uh, with the town uh, and an understanding of the, the three sets of uh, change rooms and washrooms um, being able to provide the needs of the community um, that you guys have. A few other small areas that uh, are to note are uh, building service areas. Uh, so we are highlighting on the uh, on the left hand side our, our vertical transportation uh, through uh, the elevator, but also uh, the major spaces on the um, east side of the building. Uh, so the the main box in the northeast corner is our main um, mechanical room that supports the natatorium in the pool. Um, and then we have two other uh, locations in the smaller boxes for uh, additional um, internal mechanical units uh, and mechanical equipment that support the facility. This is a, a big shift from the design that uh, you would have seen in December. Um, previously, we had a lot of this equipment in a lower level, uh, but as a result of the high water table and working with uh, the consulting partners and the construction manager, there was risk and significant construction premiums to, to move forward on that uh, route. So um, accommodations were made to pull all of that equipment up to the, the ground floor level, as you see here. Yeah, so as Mike mentioned there, we have uh, raised the finished floor elevation of the um, Aquatic and, and Wellness Center up by 1.7 meters. Uh, so the new addition uh, to the facility will be raised at that, that level uh, to allow this to happen and to allow for uh, proper uh, barrier-free connections back into the existing plex. Um, the red box that we have highlighted here is our link. So our link provides a corridor and stair on the north side, and then it provides a wide ramp um, up that uh, link as well. So that gives us our connection uh, from the existing uh, plex into uh, the new facility. And again, this really was a, a cost saving measure that we worked with, um, you know, with the full consultant team, obviously with heavy input from our civil engineers and our structural engineers, but also from the, um, the construction management team as well uh, for constructability uh, to raise this side of the facility up uh, to that level. Yeah, and just to add to that, the in addition to the water table, um, the the natural grades closer to Wellington are also higher. So um, we not only were raising the finished floor to, to get our, uh, our building out of, uh, our, and our footings out of the, the flood or the, the water table, but we were also able to reduce the amount of cut. So uh, soil leaving the site and the amount of fill that you would need to, um, to, to balance the site in that way. So there, uh, there were some savings in the earthworks as well tied to that elevation change. So moving up to level two, uh, so back into the natatorium in the viewing area, um, the red box that we have shown here um, provides us open views uh, into the natatorium. Um, it's mostly fixated over top of the uh, the lap pool, the eight lane pool, uh, but still does provide great coverage and exposure to the leisure pool as well on the uh, left hand side of the natatorium. Uh, highlighted in this red box is um, an allocation of space for municipal offices and council chambers. Um, we're still working through the considerations and the final understanding of this space, um, but through all the preliminary conversations, uh, knowing what the needs of the program are, um, that is, I guess, being kind of noted as Workplace 2.0 in the council chambers, is that uh, this area does give us uh, enough space to, to give allocation to both of those major programs. Uh, and these will be further developed uh, as the design progresses with, um, with the town. Uh, last time we met, uh, we were talking about operational savings and sustainability as two of the main values for the project. Um, I, where we left was that uh, we should be considering these and doing our best to incorporate them um, uh, with the budget that, that we had available for the project. 
what we can relay to council is that uh, your building will still be solar ready. So we won't be putting the full solar array in as part of this scope of work, but it is being designed and engineered to support um, solar array and um, the space will be allocated in uh, the building services to facilitate that connection when uh, the time is right. We're still uh, using waste heat from um, the ice pad uh, for the new building. So we are recycling some of that energy and uh, reusing it as part of our building. Um, so that is still a consideration uh, that we're incorporating. Uh, we had spoken about uh, low carbon materiality and the use of heavy timber. Uh, at this point, um, we couldn't find a way to make the budget work with, with incorporating that into the project. So unfortunately that's not in the project as, uh, as we're seeing it in its current state, um, uh, mainly because of costs. All right, so we'll talk a little bit about next steps and recommendations and kind of give a snapshot in time of where we are with the project right now. So um, this bar chart and kind of breakdown of the milestones of the schedule um, is giving a dictation of where we um, have gone through right now and where we are currently and the next uh, steps that we're going to go through for the project. Uh, so starting from left to right, we did have that council direction on the design and budget uh, in December of last year. Uh, so the site plan approval and application, uh, we were looking to push that through in May. Uh, and we can happily say that that submission was actually made today um, to the formal site plan application, but we have gone through multiple uh, meetings with Jay and, and other folks as well at the town to, you know, kind of get ourselves through the major hurdles and kind of work as, as a collective group which we are super supportive of and thankful for, for Jay and his team's time on that. So we are here uh, moving towards the end of May. Our next major milestones that we're gonna be moving into for the project is getting into the permitting process. Um, and we are looking to move into our first permits uh, that we'll be applying for as the site servicing and foundations. Uh, those will allow uh, the construction start to happen on the site and move into um, the site servicing being rooted on the property and then also digging the area required for the foundations uh, for the new build. We'll be kind of completing construction documents that have started uh, technically now, but they will be also um, completed in November. Those will be completed in a fashion to support uh, the construction management team and the multiple tenders that they will be issuing as well. So we're working in a collaboration process with them uh, to supply the documentation in time to allow for those tenders uh, to be released to the public um, and bid on accordingly and given the time uh, for the consultant team as well as the town's team to reflect on the bids that are received. And construction will continue um, obviously through the year and through 2024 and we're looking at a substantial completion date uh, in February of 25, uh, which will allow the town to move in and uh, occupy the, the new space uh, shortly thereafter. Okay, then uh, I guess that's the end of the presentation. So thank you very much. So there is a recommendation that council receive the Aquatics and Wellness Center site plan report for information. So we'll ask if there's questions or comments uh, from members of the Deputy Mayor. Thank you. And through you, um, Ryan and Mike, Mike and uh, Jay and whoever else was involved, um, appreciate the efforts. I don't know if it was said up front, my apologies if I just uh, um, verbally uh, missed it. Um, all of this um, redesign seems to be related to the fact that the um, the estimate was off by about $10 million the first time we saw it. So we're, we're trying to fit it into that almost $50 million that, that we created. Um, I, I really hope that um, escalating costs, you know, that we, we have a good sense now that um, this is going to be possible because I know you you managed to still fit everything in there and it it, it looks reasonable um but it would be a shame if, if you know we, we have to dig dig further into um redesign going forward i'm disappointed that the uh, council chambers and and municipal staff part um which we thought um was a was a, a good sort of mix in with all of this that 
you know, maybe it, it might be a little different than, than I had envisioned. Um, because I think, you know, as a leading community in Ontario and Canada, and very specifically in Bruce County, you know, we we have a chance to to show that we, we really recognize the value of municipal government. Um, I also just wanted to comment uh, on a couple of things. Um, the comments about the future second ice pad, uh, I think it's important that, that the public know that um, that's, that's off in the future, um, that um, it's not... Um, part of the project. It won't be immediately necessarily right after this. It may, but it may not. Um, so that, that's that's just being put there as a placeholder. And um, it's good that it's there, um, but uh, not necessarily going to happen um, as fast as some people I think would like it to happen. I also think um, it's really important that we recognize um, the value that um, eventually taking a look at grades of surrounding properties and, and the water table, the value of doing that, um, because it, it certainly has made some significant changes in um, the height of the building and all that kind of stuff. So anybody planning to build, you know, take a good look at the ground um, as you start your planning, because that, that can help you plan appropriately. I did want to specifically comment though about the, the outdoor space. Um, it was mentioned, the words placemaking were used a couple of times and, and um, I'm all for that, and um, you know I, I can appreciate the putting off a little bit the idea of a little bit of exterior and enhancement um, along the way. But um, I did notice um, an opportunity that I, I think we should incorporate into the drawings. You've got on one side of the entrance the civic civic square, I think it's called. That's fine. On the other side, it says outdoor programming area. I would really appreciate if there was consideration given to extending that a little bit further so that then um, the parking lot that's behind the current Nuclear Innovation Institute sort of lines up with it because then it sets up a much greater opportunity for an outdoor event of a larger scale because you've got something sort of planned there on the side of the building that, that you can easily block off the parking lot and have a much bigger space. You know, we had an event here in the Plex on the weekend that um, the weather didn't cooperate, of course, on Saturday, but, you know, a, a, an outdoor space um, that had uh, room for expansion if needed, you know, could accommodate um, a bouncy wonderland out there um, instead of having to, to force it into the plex. So um, it, it looks like, um, you know, it could happen, um, but just on the drawings, if it was kind of there, it just sets, sets an idea, I think, in motion that um, there's a, a, a visual there of a much greater space for outdoor activities, taking advantage of a, a parking lot to add into that when, when the crowd warrants it. Um, I appreciate um, all the work that was done. Um, I, I was excited about the Taj Mahal, particularly about the, the timbers on the roof. I, I'm, I'm a little let down, but I understand. Um, I also um, wonder about, um, you know, I, I get the holiday tree idea, but that's a downtown thing. So, um, you know, I, I hope that um, the BIA at least will be made aware of, you know, this idea that um, that downtown tree in Coulter Park at might not be it going forward, but appreciate all the work and um, hopefully we've got the numbers in the right spot now and won't see any big, big increases going forward. Thank you. Anyway, Guy, yeah, uh, the Director of Community Services Operations. Uh, thank you. And through you, Mr. Mayor, just uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Mayor, for the comments. Just one thing that I'd like to mention um, is that the considerations for the Workplace 2.0. Um, so we're currently looking through, uh, working through the design phase of that element of the project. Uh, so by no means is it uh, reduced to the point um, where, where, where we're not showing staff the, the importance of the work that they do and that they come, they report into a work that is, that is functional, that is safe, that is um, accessible uh, and, and important to them as well. So it will be a, a big consideration for that, uh, for this, uh, for the component of that project. And we're looking forward to further designing that. It's just not complete yet. So thank you. Do you want to just speak to the deputy mayor's question about, you know, which she made an excellent point about the fact that, you know, the cost came in higher uh, than what we'd anticipated on the last one. How, what, how can, can you talk to council about giving us about where you're at now with costs and give us an assurance that, you know, the number you're arriving at here on this project before us is something that we're going to be able to have some confidence in that's that's not going to slip even further. 
Sure, and, and thank you for that, Mr. Mayor. And I'll look to uh, Mike and Ryan, and I know that Lisa and Steve uh, are also on the call tonight um, as well. So as part of the presentation um, through Let and Salter Pilon in December was their cost estimate for the project. It came in just at the $49 uh, million dollar mark. Um, we brought on the construction uh, manager for Ball Construction. Uh, part of their responsibilities was to provide, provide us with a class C cost estimate. Uh, that was prepared to us in February, I believe. Uh, and it did come in uh, higher, about $10 million higher. Uh, so the one of the benefits of the construction management method is that we bring that uh, the construction manager to the table early so that they can be involved in some of those design uh, questions, especially where we need to focus on budget and reductions uh, to not compromise program and functionality of the building, but to find some cost savings uh, and explore some opportunities with that. Uh, so currently we've been working with our design team, including Ball Construction and, uh, and Mike and Ryan and their team as well, uh, in order to bring the project uh, to within budget, uh, which was approved by council, but there has been some sacrifice that is made, but I believe that uh, those options that we've considered have not impacted uh, the overall experience of the building that it will bring to the community. Okay, I have Gavinsky and then Grace. And then staff. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Several comments, several questions now through you. First of all, thank you, Michael. And uh, thank you, Ryan, for your report. Um, it's a wonderful report and we're, we're moving forward. As far as the cost goes, that was just brought up. If you recall, when we talked about cost the last time I said, put everything in and then we can start taking out. Um, and that's exactly what we've done. Uh, would I like to see the cathedral ceilings in the uh, pool? Yes, I would. But um, it appears it's it's not going to happen. But the pool is there, and it's an eight-lane pool, and uh, I can settle uh, for that. A couple of questions. Um, we still have the... Um, a spectator area for the meets. I do believe I heard someone say that. And if you could just confirm that for me, please. That's correct. Oh, yeah. Okay, sorry. The relocated generator is proposed for the Wellington Street area. It's going to be screened with landscape and so on, but could this become a possible noise issue for abutting neighbors. Well, I, okay, Jay, through you, through you, Mr. Mayor, to Jay. If I may, I, I certainly will defer to Ryan or Michael as needed. But the uh, you know the generator doesn't run uh, you know continuously for long long periods of time. But nevertheless, these are designed so that they manage the uh, the noise. And we had this discussion just uh, last week about how that is that is mitigated and. The, the main measures are with the landscaping and the screening that's there. So I'm confident the uh, the noise is going to be limited to only as needed for the, that that use. And it will be needed when, like during a power outage, that sort of thing. Yes, during power outage. I mean, I know ours uh, only goes on for about ten minutes every uh, two weeks, so it's a very short period of time during normal operating, and then during emergency periods, well, uh, you know. Uh, I, you know, even then, it's it would only be for the 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 duration of the event needed for the running of the generator. Okay, let's go inside now. The um, and uh, that Michael or Ryan could answer this. The change rooms themselves, do they belong to both the pool and fitness, or are they separate for each um, activity? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, um, they're for both sides. They're they are uh, dedicated for the for the natatorium for the pool, uh, as well for the wellness side of the building. Okay, thank you. Move from the basement because of the high water level. So we moved all the uh, equipment, if you will, to the next floor. So who got squeezed there? If we put that in, then we had to make something else smaller. What did we make smaller? You want me to speak to that one, Ryan? Yeah, go, go ahead, Mike, sure. <laughs> sure, through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, the footprint generally, 
pushed slightly towards Wellington Street. Um, but at the same time, the biggest change that we made to reduce square footage is the change to the track where we previously had a larger radius on the edges. It was a, a running track. Um, we now still have curved edges, but it's more of a walking, jogging track. Um, that change alone had a significant impact to the overall gross floor area. Okay, and um, we talked about, uh, well, the deputy mayor did about the uh, council chambers, Reno, um, not moving ahead at this time or being low down on the scale. And I suppose that's necessary. We have to think of the people first, but it's still council renovations is part of thinking of the people. We haven't had people in here really for a year and change. As a matter of fact, uh, in my time on council, it will be two years this, uh, this November. And I think we have to do something to renovate the council chambers so that we can get the people back in here on uh, council days. I think we, we owe that to them. Um, so I hope we can move that along as quickly as possible. And yes, uh, uh, through the mayor to Kristen. Uh, yes, thank you very much, uh, Councillor Davinsky, and through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I should I should have included that through our consideration and design of uh, Workplace 2.0, that does include council chambers and some uh, and and upgrades to uh, to our setup here uh, that we have to invite public back, um, better audio visual uh, improvements made in that regard as well. Thank you. And uh, one final thing, since it doesn't have to all be serious, but. I noticed in some of the pictures um, that were provided by Michael and Ryan, there are some transit buses in there. You people know something that we don't know, but we're sure looking forward to it. Thank you. Hey, thank you. So I have Grace, then Stack, then Helpman, then the Vice Deputy Mayor, then Councilor Mayette. So we'll start with Councilor Grace. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Michael and Ryan, for the updated report and the presentation. Uh, I have, I think, five questions. Um, I was very happy to see that the town has submitted uh, a funding application for the Green Buildings Program for uh, over, I guess, over $13 million. Uh, that would be terrific if we could be successful at that. My question about that is if, uh, I think it said that a requirement for that to be successful would be to develop a net zero carbon transmission, a transition plan. And part of that includes the green roof and the solar array, uh, both of which are going to be delayed at this point. Um, so am I correct in, in understanding that if we are successful, those would be back in the picture? Yeah, so through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, to, to Councillor. We have uh, put a design in place that allows for those future sustainable targets and provisions uh, to come online in the building if that grant is provided. So we've done our due diligence within our, um, you know, most air mechanical and electrical design, but on the architectural side as well, to ensure that if that funding and that grant does become uh, a reality uh, for the town, that there is an ability to uh, activate that within uh, some of the sustainable features uh, that we have talked about with regards to the mechanical and electrical systems for the project. Okay, and, and uh, to follow up on that, so the roof, you would have to do a certain type of design and preparation in order to transition to a green roof. Is that true? Correct. So the, the design for the green roof is slightly different. Uh, it does allow us timing in our schedule right now to modify it should that be the case. Uh, and for the solar panel array, the roof no different has to be planned correctly for the solar panels as a future uh, system as well. And the sloped roof um, over top of the, the wellness side, the gym and the track area uh, is being designed with that system that would allow for a future installation of um, the solar panels there as well. So both roof conditions have been considered in that, that design. Uh, do you have any idea of um, 
if we were able to have the solar array in place, what difference that would make to uh, our energy bills? Uh, at this time, we don't have a direct understanding of what that would be. Um, we do need to confirm, obviously, the area uh, that would be provided for uh, the solar array there. Um, but that would be a future calculation that we would complete um, with sustainability consultants likely on that side as well. Okay, just one last question. Um, are you planning any EV charging stations in the parking lot? There is plans for EV charging stations. Do you know how many? Mike might know. Yeah, there, we're relocating uh, your current chargers uh, to, um, to the west of the property, and there will be other EV charging stations located near the NII. Uh, the total number is four, I believe. So that, what do we have right now? Two? Yeah, two is my understanding. Hmm. It'd be nice if we, we could have more than four. That doesn't just my opinion doesn't seem like an awful lot. I mean, we could also, you know, charge people for it, not necessarily offer it for free, but make it available. Thanks. Director. Uh, thank you. And, and through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, thank you, Councillor uh, Grace, for those comments. Um, a takeaway from last week's meeting was to look at the EV uh, charging stations, the location and the number of them. Uh, so we'll be continuing that. Uh, we're also exploring some opportunities for partnerships for EV charging stations through a county program, a regional program, uh, and also if the municipality is interested in uh, doing any private um, partnerships with those as well. So thank you. Okay, Councillor Stack. Thanks. Just a couple of quick question and clarification. So the by moving some of the, the um, equipment for the building up onto the main floor. Is that all we mean by the elimination of the basement? Um, I learned what the word uh, natatorium meant this morning. Um, so thank you to our um, CAO for defining that for me. When I read that last night, I had no idea what that word meant. Um, but I just wanted to clarify. So all we're saying is we're just removed. We don't need that basement because we don't need the utility space. But that's all that that meant when we say elimination. But for the through you, Mr. Mayor, for the most part, that's true. There were some additional programmatic benefits if the basement would have um, been able to be included, uh, like lane storage and things that aren't on the walls of the natatorium. Um, so uh, there would have been some, some benefits uh, had it been possible, but uh, given the water table and pulling the equipment out, it, it was just such a premium for that kind of benefit that it wasn't necessarily worth it at that point. Thank you. And then um, one final question, just on the lanes. We, we talked about earlier that there was no material change to the benefit of the facility as a result of some of these changes. Did, do we know whether other facilities in the area have more running lane or more track lane than what we're proposing? I'm just concerned by cutting the lane down. If you're reducing the usage substantially, I think it does change the the overall usage of the building. So through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, to Councillor Zach there. Um, what we could say is that two is traditional for a running for a walking track. Two lanes is very traditional. Uh, Owen Sound is two lanes uh, for reference. Um, three lanes is not the norm. Uh, so we did tour some other facilities, including Aurelia's new facility. Um, and the three lane track is still beyond what, what a typical walking slash running track would be for, for most facilities um, within you know, the Southern and Central areas in Ontario. I would say the other piece to add is that there are the three lanes still, but it's still a 125 meter loop, um, which also isn't uh, kind of standard, right? The, the Bradford, uh, leisure center that um, Ryan's firm and and, our, and my firm worked on together uh, does have a track above the gym, but it's tight on the second floor to the gym, so it doesn't actually have a full 125 meter um, distance. So uh, that that loop has still been maintained in the current design. Thanks. And just one final question. Um, so you talked about glazing um, for the materials. Are you just saying is glazing? 
I made potentially an incorrect assumption that glazing is typically like what we would put on windows for um, a heat and energy efficiency. Is that accurate or are we talking about purely a design feature? Glazing is Arky speak for glass or windows. Uh, so we should have, we should have, we're, we're trying to be fancy with natatorium and glazing, you know, but uh, essentially it's just windows on the exterior. Uh, we just reduce the number the of windows. We just reduce the number of windows. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Or the amount of windows more so than the number. We're building a beautiful glazed natatorium. Uh, up is Councillor Helper. Thank you, Mayor, and through you, Mayor. A um, couple of questions. I have five and a half feet is how much you're raising it like from the original. Is that going to pose problems for meeting up to the existing building? Like, so you're, you're saying this new building will be five and a half feet higher than the, the floor of the current area that we're in now. Would that be correct? Yeah, through you, Mr. Mayor, that is that is correct. Uh, that is the, the definition of the height adjustment that we are providing there. Um, the difference in finished floor elevations is purely being made up within that link condition there. So we still meet all of our AODA and barrier-free requirements in that space for path of travel. Um, it is only in that link that we have the, the difference in elevations uh, felt within the two buildings. Okay, thank you. I'm going on to some of the green requirements. What What is the R value of the walls that you're proposing and the R value of the ceiling? So the R value of the walls and the ceiling and through you, Mr. Mayor, we're, we're looking at those and we'll finalize the exterior design um, with our construction management team. Um, but we are looking at meeting or exceeding um, the, the building code uh, for those, those walls. The pre-eng building that we're proposing um, also comes with some elements of pre-eng uh, exterior materials and the uh, exterior facade or envelope of the building. And we're looking at those uh, with our pre-eng team when they're brought on board to have an understanding of what those uh, exact R values are. Um, but that is something that we can follow up with on as far as the R values for the, the envelope of the building in, in all aspects. And, and that, that is a, a worthy question. Thank you. And then, so what is the building code for our values for walls and ceilings for institutional buildings like this? I know for a house, your walls now have to be very close to R30 and your ceilings are about R50. How does that compare to an institutional building? Yeah, so for the building and through you, Mr. Mayor, um, to respond to that, we're typically looking at an R value of 40 uh, in, in the roof assemblies. And we're looking at an R value um, in the exterior facade, it kind of gets a little bit murky in the sense of how much glazing we have um, and how much uh, exposure we have in those openings as well. Uh, but we're looking at our values anywhere between uh, 20 and 25 typically in those, those wall assemblies as well. Thank you. Um, having those higher R values and things, will that also make it easier to apply for those uh, green energy loans and grants? And I'm kind of piggybacking on what Councillor Grace said as well. Like, um, uh, like, do we, is there not a good benefit to having those things incorporated in our design to go after those grants rather than saying, if you give us these grants, we will do that? I, through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Construction is generally a series of decisions that need to be made based on information that you have uh, at the time and the resources that you have that you can attribute to a project. Um, in all best instances, you would have the most robust envelope with the, the best glazing and um, you know uh, the most future ready roof systems for solar, solar PV if they're not instantly incorporated to get you to a net zero. Um, building, we know that the premium to get to a net zero building is in the range of 9% um, of your construction cost. And the unfortunate reality is that we've been spending 
quite a bit of time with uh, the construction managers on sifting through the timber, the green roof, the solar, the increased site amenities and the increased public squares, which are all the premium items that we talked about back in December to see what can we incorporate that'll give the best value to your um, community based on operational savings, sustainability and uh, community focus, which were the three values for your project. So the short answer to your question is yes, absolutely. The long answer is that it's complicated. <laughs> because you have to um, balance fit and finish, which is, which is um, sustainable elements, um, program, which is square footage and, and your budget. Uh, so I do think that this project team has been working really hard to, to get you the best value for your project overall. Um, but unfortunately, you know, the most robust envelope assemblies do come with a premium that um, to Ryan's point, once we get a, a trade partner involved, especially if it's going to be a prefabrication uh, trade partner, which will be a procured package as part of our tendering sequence. Um, we can try to get as much of a robust assembly as possible with the budget that we have allocated for the project. We just don't, aren't in a position where we can tell you those exact figures at this point. Thank you. Um, yeah, it, it's incumbent upon us as being like a clean energy leaders and, and everything that we promote Saugeen Shores for to be as green as is possible. And, you know, money spent on insulation and money spent on anything to reduce future heating costs uh, and maintenance costs is always prudent because I can never think of a time when our energy costs are going to be lower. So, um, I, I just think we need to push to get these things in. I was talking to someone in the, the Clinton arena. Uh, when they put their solar panels on, there was a little bit of pushback on it, but it turned out to be a very profitable decision for them to do that. And with solar price, solar panel prices coming down and being more affordable, I think if there's any way at all, we should be doing this. And perhaps that should be the first thing that we raise money for because the solar panels and that are gonna give us a benefit from day one, from day one when they're hooked up, we're gonna be getting a benefit from them. I, I realize the cost on that, that, that was just a comment. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. All right, so now we have the vice deputy mayor. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And first, thanks, Michael and Ryan Schreid, Steve Hardy, uh, getting us to the tonight has been a tremendous amount of work and everyone's done a, a fabulous job really. And, Bring that number from 60 million down to under 50, um, something we had to do. And uh, let's hope we, the final number comes in under that 50 mark. And, you know, challenge to the community, right, is that that fundraising campaign, uh, we, we need we need the community to get involved. And uh, try and get that number down from 49 into the, it'd be nice to get into the 30, 35 range with grants, you know. Right, so when will we hear back about that $13 million grant uh, program? How soon will we hear back? Uh, thank you for the question. And through you, Mr. Mayor, um, I'll have to follow up to see when the announcement would be made for success, successful applicants. So I'll, I'll forward that information back to council. I appreciate that. I, I too, like the, the deputy mayor of the Timbers would have a nice, it's one of the nice things to have. And uh, I guess my question to to Michael and Ryan, we eliminated that. It would have been dramatic. Um, um, how, how much? How much was the savings again to, to reduce the uh, the timber? Yeah. So three. You, no, you go ahead. Okay. So three, Mr. Mayor. We the the timbers were um, not necessarily a direct number. There was a bunch of uh, structural elements that kind of factored into an overall number. But when we started looking. Um, through the natatorium and the design of the structure and what we were going to have to do there, uh, there was numbers that were roughly in the range of, of $2 million of savings within the structural premiums in that area. Those are some of the reasons that we thought that that was uh, a valuable choice. The second part of that was also scheduling. So as you can imagine, those are long span timbers. Um, they're not something that you're gonna just pick up off the shelf anywhere. So the fabrication time and the delivery time to have those uh, brought to site would also have impacted the overall construction schedule for the project in a negative way. 
and we would have been delayed in the overall process of getting the facility open um, based on items like that as well as as Michael mentioned you know there is a lot of decisions that go through the design and as we factor in uh, to our construction team as well uh, schedule drives the project just as much as the budget does and we had to be ensure uh, not only on the timbers but on other items as well um, to plan for those in a in a thoughtful way in our construction strategy to ensure that any long lead items have the ability to be procured and delivered to the property um, for on time um, sequencing of the construction and the timelines that we were given back for the manufacturers on those heavy timbers wouldn't have aligned with the schedule that's being proposed for the project good, good explanation and appreciate if, that if if i could add to just to that on the on the topic of of the timbers um the benefit of of construction management is that um, you have a construction partner helping you to 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 move through design uh, tied to an ongoing budget that's evolving constantly. So we're going to be putting out tender packages and getting numbers in. Um, we have a bucket of funds in in our construction management budget for things like the, the roof structure of the natatorium. And and earlier today we were talking with. Um, the design team and, and the builders about, you know, what other options could we consider? So with the idea of timber, you know, it, it's, there's still potential that we could put a timber deck or a CLT panel between um, the trusses. And so we're still being the squeaky wheel on the design team, knowing that it's a value saying, hey, can we tender this and get as a separate price? Can we, can we look at other options to incorporate these elements so that when we get the fixed prices, we have a series of options still tied to the overall values for the project. Okay. So um, it would be great if we could still incorporate those. We're still trying really hardly to, really hard to, to incorporate as much as we can. We hear what council is saying. Um, and uh, we, we hope to be able to report back with some updates on that as the project progresses. One of those things, you know, I've been at a lot of pools around Ontario, and that's one of the nice things uh, that could have happened, but it may be just too too costly. Um, the uh, so we'll we'll be looking at a steel steel press steel roof, right? Eh? I mean, maybe you'll be looking at looking at steel, and that's that's the way it no doubt will be. The 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 three the four lane walking track, and on pages uh, uh, five twenty six twenty seven twenty eight four lanes, page 31, switch to three, and then pages 32, 33, 34, for the price, 36, all talk about four, but uh, we're, we're, we're three lanes. Maybe there's change in the report, perhaps, but um, what was the cost savings, uh, and uh, you know, similar to the, the ceiling, I guess, uh, over the pool, but that fourth lane going to three, what, what was that cost saving? What did that amount to? So through you, Mr. Mayor, um, the cost savings on, on that specific item kind of entails itself into the overall design, again, much like the natatorium on the wellness side. So in looking at the um, the area of the of the wellness side in the gym area is that we were looking at a few different things. So we were looking at a structural module in there that would support the pre eng building. Um, and obviously not having columns land within any of the the main uh, functioning areas. Um, we changed the shape of the track as well to help support that pre end structure that would help eliminate the cost in there as well. And for the savings in there, we would have to go back and kind of look at a direct relationship of what the cost savings was specifically for uh, the one lane to come out of there, uh, Vice Deputy Mayor. Um, but we can pass that information along through uh, the director and, and back That's to council if needed. I understand that change and that's a good change from four to three, obviously, again, uh, we have to get that 60 million down to under 50. Um, I've been, I've, I've been to the family Y in home sound a couple of times. I've, I've, I've been down in the basement in the mechanical room. It's very, very, very noisy. And I've been to other pools across the province in the basement is where mechanical rooms belong. In my view, they're extremely noisy. With the, uh, the the mechanical room being on ground level, um, how noisy is that going to be uh, on deck side? How many, I mean, I'm sure sure the walls are well insulated, and do everything to protect that uh, that noise from from moving out into the pool deck area. But boy, they can be that, that's a, that's a, that's a noisy operation. Uh, those those pumps are big, so uh, what kind of noise are we going to hear in the pool deck from our mechanical room. Yeah, so through you, Mr. Mayor, on that comment, uh, the goal is that they're not going to be noticeable on deck for the sound that's going to be provided there. 
Uh, so we do have um, some mitigation factors that we provide within the design. So the pumps in that um, are provided on isolation pads. So noise, yes, is one of the things, but the second portion of it too is also vibration. And when you combine vibration with noise, um, that's where the, the true impact uh, kind of gets magnified. So those units will be um, isolated on structural pads uh, to have that ability to reduce the vibration. Uh, and then those rooms, yes, have to be well designed and, um, you know, back to the construction manager as well is also well constructed to meet those uh, so sound transmission ratings that we are trying to provide in those rooms. Uh, so at this point, we don't see any adverse effect or any noise coming from those uh, pieces of equipment uh, onto the pool deck or affecting any of the other areas that they're adjacent to as well. By eliminating basement and to do with lane storage, um, let's talk about storage in general. One of the first things that gets cut with uh, with big commercial buildings like this is storage. And uh, I've seen it in my, in my previous days in Parks and Recreation. Um, how how um, I guess uh, how much how much we're going to see on our decks uh, on the pool deck uh, in terms of um, storage of materials? Are we going to be able to hide that stuff away, like your lane markers and separations? And I mean, where where are all those things going to be stored? Have you left ample amount of space for storage? Through you, Mr. Mayor, we have two dedicated storage spaces off of the pool deck. Um, and we've we've got uh, some deep alcoves near the mechanical spaces as kind of transitional space allocated more specifically for storage. Um, at this point, because we're construction management, our first package will be going out, uh, which is site servicing. Our last package will be um, our interiors. And uh, we're still relatively... Uh, early in terms of allocating the dedicated space for every specific piece that needs to be stored on deck. But we we're confident with the area that we currently have allocated that, um, and in comparison to some of the other facilities that we've done, that, that there's a reasonable amount of storage currently still off deck. With, with the $10 million cut, was storage cut? So just for clarity's sake, the, the $10 million when that was budgeted included elements that, um, that were premium items. So there was in that budget um, numbers for uh, timber, solar, increased uh, site area, full site square amenities. Um, so when we pull that out to apples to apples, we were uh, we weren't ten million dollars over. We were just slightly over, and we've been able to refine our program area and some of our fit and finish elements to get down to a $600 a square foot um, current number. So the short answer is no, we haven't cut any storage area, um, but we have reduced program in particular around the track, um, some slight reductions to conditioning and fitness in order to make um, the budget align at this point. Okay, thank you. And, and just a few more questions, Mr. Mayor, short ones, but the, the BMX track, um, all of the soils, I, I, with your height elevation change by five feet, you're going to be able to maintain use a lot of that to reuse a lot of that soil from the VMX track. Yeah, that was one of the, oh, sorry, three, Mr. Mayor. Um, that was one of the, um, the uh, benefits uh, of raising the grade is that uh, it works much better with the natural grade at Wellington street. So it did reduce a lot of the, the cut that we would have otherwise had to make if we were to, to keep the floor levels aligned. I've always been concerned about parking at the Flex dating back three, four years ago. I actually didn't support the site initially, um, but it's coming here uh, attached to the Plex. Uh, going from um, 400, uh, you're going up to 400, uh, just look at my notes, you're going from 200 and some to 400 and some. And um, and then you were, and then what you're saying is the third, the third ice pad happened to reduce them by 40. But you're adding back 40 somewhere else. I heard in your comments earlier, you're going to add back 40 somewhere on the site. Where are those 40, if, if, if a third ice, a second ice pad did happen, where are those 40 additional spaces coming from? Through you, Mr. Mayor, there is additional real estate on the southwest corner of your property. Um, the complication with that location is some of the abutting grades. Um, if we were to fill that 
portion of the site, um, it would require more extensive stormwater management infrastructure to be incorporated into the project. Um, so uh, there's, um, there is real estate there, but at this point we've got kind of a, a dry pond stormwater feature there to, to deal with the stormwater. So to do with parking, um, you know, if, 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 if you know, you got an eight lane pool here and you got Saturday afternoon public swim with 100, 200 people there, public skating, 100, 200 people public skating, 100, 200 people using the fitness center, another 50 using the walking track, six, seven, 800 users, 1,000 users one day, 400 parking spots. Are you 100% comfortable, confident that is putting 800,000 people perhaps using this site at one time with all these amenities? Are you 100% confident we've got enough parking on this site? For you, Mr. Mayor, I know that we're uh, meeting the zoning, zoning bylaws for the prescribed use. Um, the zoning bylaw is, is dictated based on the prescribed use and people per area. Um, so on that basis, uh, this building is gonna function with the parking that's provided. Um, that being said, there's likely going to be major events um, that'll draw significant people to this, this building. Um, in many ways, that's going to be a success of this building to have it as a community anchor for those jump, uh, those uh, bouncy counts, castles behind the NII building. Um, and in those events, they're likely, in all honesty, will have to be some accommodation for additional parking offsite. And your street, um, street parking. We're talking about uh, north of Tomlinson Drive towards the police station, for example in the surrounding area, like parking on streets for, for, for times where there's big events, right? For you, Mr. Mayor, I'm not gonna make any suggestions oh. on where that could be, but there might need to be some accommodation. I see Jay, Jay has his no, hand I, up. Supervisor uh, Development yeah. Service have a comment? Yeah, no, I just like, I think that's part of what we do is if, when we're event planning is we're examining, uh, you know, we're firstly, we're not planning for and zoning for the maximum amount of automobile users we're trying to balance the use of the site for all participants encourage people to use multiple modes of transportation to get there through the design of the site and then plan for those events uh, with our program coordinators and staff to ensure that you know appropriate on-street parking yes you've identified Tomlinson or it could be McKenzie or it could be Wellington but manage those you know rare events you know super successful but rare events okay. and that that site is appropriately used thank, thank you Jay. one last question mr mayor i promised the public i'd ask this question because i've had lots of people mention to me the gymnasium the triple y gymnasium and you talked about uh, 12 pickleball courts which is wonderful i think you said 12. um i have had a fair number of people ask me about an indoor facility the gymnasium could double over to be used as a, a center of excellence for ball, soccer, um, all, all four seasons. Um, can, I guess anything can be done, but is there is there an opportunity for a portion of the gymnasium to be covered with, in the future, in the future, with AstroTurf? And I'm talking about for ball and soccer, uh, big, big users out there that are looking for indoor use that can't find indoor uses. Um, is that something that can be considered strides in the future? Uh, thank you for the question and through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I, I think that even what you've heard tonight is, is anything is possible, um, but our, our budget limits us. Um, so at this point, um, turf is not included in the budget, uh, but it's not to say that it can't be something that's considered in the future and that we can identify for council uh, okay. consideration down the road. Okay. Again, from Mr. Mayor to the uh, to Shrides and and, uh, and Michael and Ryan, and you did a you've done a fabulous job to getting us to this point, and can't wait for August fifteenth to get the first shell on the ground and uh, swimming. Well, the mayor wanted it January first, twenty twenty five, but it looks like it's going to be March first. No, I wanted it for Christmas, and there's <laughs> and there still can be water in that tank at Christmas. I'm counting on you to do it. All right, so I've got. Uh, I've got uh, Councillor Mayette, and I think I saw Councillor Jahane put his hand up. I don't know if he's still wanting to make a comment, but we'll get Councillor Mayette, and then we can come to Councillor Jahane. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and through you, 
Uh, we've had a lot of conversation, so I won't belabor this any longer, but uh, I did have one question that was asked of me that I wasn't able to answer. And uh, that is, is the pool being designed to be salt water or chlorinated? Uh, three, Mr. Mayor. So the, the pool there, uh, it is, uh, uh, it's a chemical pool. It's not a salt water pool. No, oh, so it's chemical. Okay, thank you. That's all I have. Okay, Councilor Jaheim, did you have a question? Yeah, through you, Mr. Mayor, I uh, just want to say to the team, uh, very uh, good work on getting the uh, cost down uh, from 60 million below 50. Um, and just on the issue of parking, uh, I was at the rec laws on Sunday night and for big events like that, I think um, it'd be wise for the, the municipality and the, um, the volunteer groups uh, to, uh, you know, push the use of public transportation. I know uh, groups had organized private buses uh, for the event. Um, so I think that can help on the uh, the big events that will come uh, to the center. That's all. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so thank you all for your comments. A lot of questions. I think that's appropriate because it's a complicated and an expensive project and uh, we want to make sure we get it right. I think though, you know, it's important just to remember that um, all the important things are in this facility still, right? We've got the, the pool, which we badly need. We've got a great walking track, gymnasium, uh, the uh, fitness facility. Uh, so uh, although it's been, uh, you know, a little tinkering here and some tinkering there and some adjustments around the edges, the, the facility is uh, still delivering everything that we need it to deliver. And it's going to be a beautiful building too. I think I, I like the, the images of the elevations. I think they look good. And uh, um, so I think... Uh, you know, I think everything uh, is lining up well, and and certainly, um, you know, we we very much need it to um, be a, a facility we can afford to build. We can't afford to build this facility, uh, and within our existing um, within our existing budgets. Uh, but you know, we have a top end limit to how much we can spend, and that fifty million is that top end limit. So I very much appreciate staff's work and our consultants' work to get us there. That allows us to move this forward and. Uh, I, you know, as I say, it's going to be a great facility. I have two questions. One, as much as my children uh, love the ramp in the existing centennial pool, they love it. Every child, including myself, you know, when I was 10 years old, ran up and down the ramp at the centennial pool. Um, but it's ridiculous, right? And we don't want to have, we don't want to repeat that. And I, so I see the I see that change in elevation and that ramp leading from the existing flex to the current flex. I just want to like a reassurance that that's going to be a reasonable feeling and looking transition that it's not going to be you know something akin to mount everest you know like it has to be you know i, I just think it i i want it to look good feel maybe that's about playing with the width of it as well as the uh, the angle but i mean it's gotta it's gotta look open it's gotta look inviting it can't look insurmountable and it can't look silly so i mean is it gonna give me some reassurance on that that it's gonna be fitting uh, to you, Mr. Mayor, <laughs> um, it, it needs to meet the, the definition of the Ontario building code. So you're going to have sections that, uh, the pause. So there'll be landings, um, as you make your way along the journey, it is a significant grade change. It, it's a meter 1.7 meters. Um, and so, uh, to some, especially those with mobility challenges, it'll, it'll be a significant grade change. Um, but we're making sure that uh, that it isn't too steep of a slope and that there are areas of repose on the on the path um, and that there are moments where you can look out uh, at those moments of pause. Um, so so it's been designed in that way. Um, alongside the ramp are views into the multipurpose rooms um, and through those multipurpose rooms are also views out to the programming space to the exterior. So it, it won't be uh, a never ending tunnel or a focused view um, of a Mount Everest of, of inclination. <laughs> yeah. It's going to have uh, of moments of, of interest along its path. And you know, as your community comes and use those multi-purpose spaces and starts to use that outdoor programming space, it's gonna be somewhere where kids likely do wanna hang out because they can see everything. Um, and it is gonna be a moment of transition um, because you're, you're transitioning quite a bit of grade. Um, but I, I think it could be a really interesting design feature um, that the community will end up liking. 
well, that's good. I hope it's that because I think as you, I think you're right, but it needs to be purposely designed that way. And so it sounds like you're on that cross. I guess for a person with mobility issues, if they feel they can't traverse that, they can go directly into the natatorium from the outside in a way that would be easier. Is that correct? Like there'd be a way straight in so you don't have to climb the climb up the ramp. Yeah, there's accessible entrances uh, at the south as well, along with um, a number of accessible parking spaces at that entrance. So for somebody who has a mobility challenge, uh, who is going to the natatorium, they may opt to park in the south end as opposed to the north end, just because it'll be easier for them to get through the building and avoid that, uh, that grade change. All right, and the second thing is the civic space, the council chambers, council chambers in particular, I really don't want that to become an afterthought in the design, I, I, particularly since it's going to be, at least in this concept, upstairs. And I just was trying, trying to get a sense from the floor plan as it is, as to like, if a person walks into the building, what do they see about the access to the, to the civic space, to the council chambers, you know, and I don't know. And so I just feel like on that main floor, when you walk into the facility, there needs to be a strong sense of the council chambers being there and the access to the civic space being there and that it's and that it's part of the overall facility in a meaningful way and not just sort of sort of jammed up in a corner up in the middle there and and forgotten about and somebody walks in and has no idea that it's even there or let alone how to get there right like it should be very obvious and it should be prominent so i hope that in the design as you make that happen that you can include that not only in the space where the Council chambers will end up being, but also on that main floor and draw all that together. You have some thoughts about how you might do that. But to you, Mr. Mayor, those are exactly the conversations that we're having right now with the, the project team. Um, there are pros and cons to every location. <laughs> sure. um, and so we're exploring all of those. Um, but I, you know, I, I think the design team and most of the project team agree in general that it's a uh, a civic building it includes your town square along with all these recreational amenities and uh, that there's a relationship between council chambers and the civic square that is important so that's definitely a major consideration as we work through your design well that's good i'll leave it in your capable hands and i hope that uh, you will uh, get the water in the pool for christmas because i have to go for a swim there it's and it's very uncomfortable to swim in an empty pool so uh, with that, you've heard the recommendation. It's just to receive the report for information. So I'll ask all in favor of that. And that is carried. Thank you very much. And thank you uh, for your presentation. Thank Appreciate you. it. All right. So now we're on to uh, number five, the Aquatics and Wellness Center funding strategy and uh, the Director of Community Services Operations has that one. Great, and uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, uh, for that. And I just, uh, a quick thank you to Ryan and uh, Michael from Salter Pilon and Lett, uh, and also on the call was uh, Steve Hardy, our project manager, and our manager of recreation, Lisa Billings. Uh, they, they've really uh, contributed to this project and, and we were happy to present the updates to you tonight. Um, so the funding strategy, this report is a summary of the path uh, for funding opportunities and fundraising that the town is planning for the aquatic and wellness project. Uh, as Council is aware, the town retained the services of Grant Match to focus on grant writing opportunities, not only for the Aquatic and Wellness Centre uh, project, but other projects that are identified in the capital forecast for the municipality. To date, Grant Match has assisted the town in submitting four grant applications valued at uh, just over $13.6 million and are continuously exploring additional opportunities. Members of Council will also recall the staff report brought forward in March of this year outlining the contract with Wellington DuPont. Uh, Wellington DuPont is a government relations firm working, uh, working to support the town with a path of advocacy with the goal of securing government funding for the Aquatic and Wellness Centre project. To date, Wellington DuPont has facilitated three meetings between the town and representatives of the provincial and federal governments. Through the services of Grant Match and Wellington DuPont, the town is exploring all all prospects available to assist with the funding opportunities for the Aquatic and Wellness Center project. A topic that members of the community and council have been asking about since the project was approved is the fundraising. So recruitment for the two year contract 
project coordinator position fell through. At that time, we were disappointed, but now see that this has provided an opportunity for a great team to be established and lead our fundraising efforts for the Aquatic and Wellness Centre project. We have retained the services of two individuals that are well known in our community, enthusiastic about recreation and wellness in Saugeen Shores and extremely dedicated and resourceful when tasked to meet an iconic milestone relating to a strategy. When this team was created, I referred to them as our powerhouse team. I'm excited to see the great things that these two will do for our community. It's my pleasure to announce that Caitlin Stone and Rob Stanley have been retained to lead our fundraising efforts for the Aquatic and Wellness Centre project. Caitlin's creativity, marketing, and strategic planning combined with Rob's background in finance, communications, and community relationships is the perfect recipe for our fundraising endeavor. Council and the public will be up updated as progress advances on funding opportunities, grant submissions, and the fundraising strategy itself. It's anticipated that the implementation of the fundraising strategy will commence this summer, starting with the quiet ask phase. So I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, so it's recommended the Council receive the Aquatic and Wellness Center funding strategy report for information. Questions or comments, Councillor Mayette. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And through you, um, to the Director, the, uh, the firms that we uh, retained to do the fund grant uh, funding, they're paid on a um, sort of a premium or a percentage of the funds that they're successful in achieving for us. Um, is the pay to these two new powerhouse teams on a similar basis? Are they incentivized in any way for the funds they're able to generate or is it just a straight salary? Uh, thank you for the question and through you, Mr. Mayor. No, we have a contract with them just for a uh, for a, a stipulated amount. Okay, for the comments or questions, the Vice Deputy Mayor. Mr. Mayor, I'd like to throw out a, a, a challenge to our community. And, um, you know, you look no further than the Julie MacArthur um, the regional rec center in Old Sound, and there was a significant, significant contribution made to put uh, that person's name on that building. And um, you know, I, I I know media are listening, and and members of the public listening, and and uh, the challenge I, I would like to issue is that there's there's a name out there, there's a name out there that I know the fundraising committee, the fundraising consultant strides will be approaching uh, one or two, three individuals about a significant. Um, contribution and put the name on the building, and but those listening, um, you know, the Rob's, Robert Stanley is well qualified. I mean, he helped, did a great job with Mount Sports Park. Caitlin Stone's well qualified, and uh, wouldn't be great to raise three or four or five million dollars um, to help lower that cost from 50 down to a, to a lower number. So, no, that's just I want to throw out to the community, and, and that's the big one. But, you know, there's uh, there, here's an opportunity. There's going to be some naming rights, I'm assuming, for all for the for the for, for the track, the fitness facility, um, some of the rooms, and uh, so those listening, please start thinking about it. Uh, we need you. We need the community to step up, you know, step up to the plate here and and uh, help help with this fundraising campaign. And we people have come through in the past, and I know they're going to come through again for the wellness center, and uh, and uh, it, it's going to be a, just just a wonderful facility. So. Those out there listening, uh, start thinking. We'll put your name in one of the rooms or, or on the building. Councillor Helpin, and then the deputy mayor. Thank you, Mayor, and, and through you. So, with the fundraising, what if someone came along and they said, "Well, we want to give you half a million dollars for your solar panels"? Could that move something like that up? Would be my question, since we are talking about about fundraising. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you for the question and through you. We obviously need to upgrade the uh, the AV because we're sharing a microphone right now. So <laughs> um, I think that that would be something that we definitely wouldn't want to turn down. I think that we would want to explore the options um, we are looking at right now. We've went through the facility as it's currently designed and identified naming right elements. Uh, so we'll be looking at those and, and perhaps there are ones that, um, you know, some of the amenities that we've uh, asked to defer that aren't being implemented right now is that those are ones that are also available for funding. So uh, we wouldn't say no to anything right now. Could we have naming rights for our solar roof, naming rights for our net zero building? Thank you. Okay, the Deputy Mayor. 
I, I thought he was offering half a million. You should, you should have signed him up right there um, through you um, to the director. Caitlin and, and Rob, um, I, I think they've started or will start soon. Um, is it your anticipation that they will be um, loading up a, a program that service clubs and, and the timing will all take place? So um, we should anticipate that too. Uh, thank you for the question and through you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, we're, we, they have started. We've had uh, a couple of preliminary meetings, as I had mentioned, um, and, and right now they are tasked with developing what that strategy looks like. And uh, once that st strategy is uh, established, that we're happy to share that with council and community. Thank you. And just as a, a, an additional comment, the vice deputy mayor has to stop with the baseball references with the pool. He's, they're not stepping up to the plate. You got to get pool references or gym references. Are they getting in the starting block or something? Because you, you know we have to move you over to a different, different away from a diamond to a, an auditorium. Why why said the mayor is going to take that under advisement? All right. Are there further questions about this one? It's a great team. And we've got, we've really pulled out all the stops to try to come up with uh, funding, uh, both government grants and uh, funding at the local level for the facility. And funding at, from wherever it comes will only make the facility better. Uh, that's the point of uh, CNS funding. You know, Councillor Helping raises opportunities to do more. That's what we want to do. And that's why we would ask, that's the only reason we would ask for people's money is to do more with this facility and to make it uh, even better. And so there's a huge opportunity for people out there who, I want to uh, contribute to um, really do something for the community to make this a great space and even better space than it already is planned to be. So, um, so I think everybody out there can expect to be hearing from our fundraising uh, teams before too long. And uh, and you know, uh, we have an extremely generous, extremely generous community. So I have every confidence that we're going to see some some um, uh, folks step forward to help support the project, and we're looking forward to that. So you've heard the recommendation. I'll ask all in favor. That's carried. And so now we're on to the final one, which is an aquatics and wellness center loan report. And the uh, treasurer has that. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. The aquatic and wellness center loan report outlines the status of a potential loan agreement with Infrastructure Ontario to fund the aquatic and wellness center. The town is pursuing a loan for up to 42.5 million with the option of construction financing during the time of the build that can be converted to long-term borrowing borrowing at any time. In the coming months, staff will return to Council for approval of a borrowing bylaw that authorizes a loan agreement with Infrastructure Ontario. At this time, or at a later date, Council can determine the exact timing of the ventures that will be sought. Thank you, and happy to take any questions. Okay, thank you. So there is a recommendation that Council receive the Aquatic and Wellness Centre Loan Report for information, questions, or comments. Happy Mayor. Thank you, and through you, um, the original financing um, information we received was that um, the legacy fund over, a, I, I, I'm going to get the date wrong, but I think it was over a 30-year period, would um, mean beyond the contributions to the legacy fund, which are built into the, the, the tax base situation, um, there would be no additional funding. Um, if if um, this loan situation happens, um, does that um, add much to the expense um, or does it extend the time period related for the legacy fund to kind of be um, attributed um, towards this project? Like what, what are the ramifications of, of the loan in terms of the interest payments and the potential length of time? Because we, I just can't remember the exact year, year number. I think it was about 30 years. Does it push that out two years, five years, 10 years, or not at all. Thank you. Uh, for you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, the 30-year the loan uh, that's, that's spoken of in this report uh, is similar to the report that Council received in December. Uh, the legacy reserve fund contributions are uh, uh, set to pay for a portion of this loan with uh, development charges, collections, paying for another portion of the loan. Uh, but all of the interest and principal payments in that 30-year loan uh, were were calculated and, and forecasted in the December report. So there's really there's no change from from this update. 
Dr. P, further questions or comments? Yeah, this verifies that uh, as we've uh, planned and projected all along, that the legacy fund will essentially cover the cost of carrying this entire facility, both carrying the borrowing costs uh, and uh, um, and also contributing some upfront uh, money to the to the build itself. So, uh, so the, um, the I think it shows the plan continues to work. But it also is worth noting that the deputy mayor raised it, and I think quite rightly earlier that um, you know to do this, the municipality has to use those funds. That was the plan, and we're going to use them. But it will mean that new large scale rec projects like additional ice pads and things are going to be a little ways down the road the municipality is only has so much money only has so much capacity to carry rec projects in the context of its broader set of responsibilities and so um so we're going to you know we we're going to be able to do this and execute the plan that we've had all along but we're not going to uh, um, be able to take fight off new big rec projects for uh, you know uh, probably several years. Councillor Helmer. Uh, thank you, Mayor, and through you. Just for me, given the choice of 4.5% for 30 years, as a person who paid 20% on a car loan, I would jump on that. Like I'm more of a long-term guy, lower rate. Thank you. Smart thinking. Take investment advice from him. Further questions or comments? I don't see any, so you've heard the recommendation. I'll ask all in favor. And that is carried. Okay. So now we're on to communications and petitions uh, for information or action. There's nine of those. Anybody want to talk about any of them? The Deputy Mayor. I have three, but I'll just do one right now. Um, number six. Um, I'm sorry, I just don't have it up in front of me. I think it was from Cambridge. Number six is the County of Prince Edward. Um, City of Cambridge is five highway traffic act amendments. Um, oh, well, then it's number five. Sorry. Um, mm -hmm. the, um, I think there's some merit, but I think we need to do a little research, um, taking advantage of some police reporting about if there's any potential areas of the community that might benefit from um, this sort of thing. Okay. Any further uh, comments on any of these items? I will come helping and then back to the other one. Thank you, Mayor, and through you. Uh, I think that everything that, that um, like on 9.6, everything we can do to, to, you know, convince the provincial government to listen to all the municipalities on, on their provincial pol uh, planning statement or PPC would be a good idea. So, you know, I, I don't think it hurts to keep the pressure on them. Thank you. And I might just say to that, the County of Bruce has produced a really excellent report uh, in the last uh, week or so, uh, and a, and a uh, series of comments that have been forwarded or are to be forwarded on to uh, the province's comments on these. I don't know if they've been circulated to the town. So we so are they so they're intended to come before us? Yeah. So we'll be receiving a set from the County of Bruce, which I think are probably the most pertinent to us. So I think we could wait to receive those. They're very good. Okay, the deputy mayor. Um, I hope I have the, the number right on this one. Through you, number nine was about utility poles. Um, I think there's there's um, an interest there that that we might um, pursue, perhaps not with support of this, but um, you know we have poles um, that have not been maintained properly. They're covered with signage. Yeah, you know, there's no. Um, sort of cleaning up going on in terms of maintenance, but also there's some areas of the community where there's like a proliferation of poles. So this this um, item number nine was about the sharing of, of poles and that sort of thing. I don't know if we should support this, but I think um, there's some merit for us to look at telecommunications infrastructure in the town, uh, because I, I don't think that um, we're always um, getting, you know, the best bang for the buck in terms of, of shared services between the companies, but also some of the equipment is in very poor repair. You know, we all know of, of the boxes um, at street level that are just a mess and covered with plastic bags and wrapped in duct tape. So um, this one's specific to poles and the sharing. Um, I think that's going on here. Um, I don't know if it's, it's as good as it can be, but um, the topic is worthy of something over the next little while for our community directly. Thank you. 
know, maybe we could forward this one on to our development services team. I know that they work directly on uh, those kinds of questions with regard to new developments and 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 across the community. So uh, I'm sure uh, there's nobody from development services here this evening, uh, but um, anyway, we could uh, certainly pass this on to them and ask for their uh, review of it. Are there further comments? I don't see any. So that brings us to the end of uh, the Committee of the Whole. We have uh, quite a bit of business yet to do, but we'll do a real quick round on uh, statements by members and we'll get the Deputy Mayor. Thank you. Um, three things. Uh, there was a police open house last week on, on Thursday evening. It was very well attended. Um, Councillor Dubinsky walked around taking some pictures. I manned or staffed the button maker, which the town generously let us use. Um, it was a very well attended event and really did, I believe, um, raise the profile of police, particularly with kids, because there were a lot of, lot of kids there. I had the pleasure of uh, going along with Lisa Thompson, our MPP, to McGregor Park on Friday because the mayor was unavailable. Um, she presented a check for almost a million dollars to McGregor Park uh, for them to uh, create some cabins to go along with their yurts to um, improve the potential for the park to be a 12 season um, or a more season destination. I also just want to give a shout out. I didn't go to the Rec Laws concert, but I was the caregiver for the children of a couple of couples that went to the, the Rec Laws concert. And um, they said, spoke very highly of the entire event, but particularly of the busing. So um, Randy, Randy Bird, when he was here, he added that on right at the end. Um, I think that busing um, was very instrumental in moving a lot of people in and out of the Plex um, for an event that, that was a big success. Thank you. You, the Vice Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr. I just wanted to thank uh, Councillor Davinsky. I attended the High Street Renewal Plan uh, open house last last Saturday morning, and the consultants were there, and the and the uh, president of the BIA was there, and and uh, you know the BIA chair. And so, John, I just want to say thank you. It was pretty well done, and uh, lots of great ideas what could happen on High Street for the for the uh, renewal plan. And uh, I like I like the ideas, you know, some of the ideas around the intersection that Walker, you know, Walker. Uh, House intersection and and here in street intersections and with four ways I think is some really I think it's one of the best yet that's been presented. There's been about two or three plans that have attended a few over the years and uh, but I think this one really hits the mark, John. I know you're gonna I didn't want to steal your thunder for later, but uh, you know it was uh, it was well done. So thanks for your efforts. I think well attended. You'll probably comment later, but uh, it was a good good open house. Yeah. You, uh, Council Matt. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. A um, couple of things. Uh, first, all the fish are on the loose. The Port Elgin hatchery is empty, and a uh, total of about 90,000 salmon are on, in the river heading for Lake, Lake Huron. In addition, I had the pleasure of uh, working with Saugeen Central School grade 3s and grade 4s. I believe the mayor's son was one of them, and uh, they, uh, they raised a bunch of rainbow trout from eggs back in the fall. And uh, that culminated with uh, with releasing of their fish. Each kid got a container, and they sang a song, and they put the fish into the river. And it was uh, pretty amazing to see these uh, grade threes and fours uh, being so delighted to be able to participate in that. And uh, on the weekend, the uh, the concerts were great. With the, the Rotary Club uh, got together and did a great job. Uh, I attended the Friday night, which was the um, 21 Gun Salute and uh, and the um, Sofa Kings, which was excellent, great rock and roll show. I I'm not a country western fan, so I didn't attend the concert on Saturday night, but I did work the gate. And I will say I was very surprised and pleasantly surprised that there, everybody was very well behaved coming in and and going out. There was a very there was a huge crowd, and uh, and there were some people who were at a pre party or two. I saw that, but uh, for the most part. Everybody was really well behaved, and with the exception of a couple of people that had to leave early, um, there was very minor uh, incidents, and uh, it was a tremendous success for the Rotary Clubs, and seeing all three of them working together was a great thing, too. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Grace. Mm, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, on Friday, um, May 19th, I attended a ceremony um, to honor Lori Kuoquam. Um, she was nominated to be the Bruce County Remarkable Citizen of the Year, and she was chosen uh, for that honor and presented with the award by Lisa Thompson, our MPP. Um, 
and I'm not sure if I mentioned she was she was nominated for the honor by CFUW Southport. A uh, very worthy recipient. Uh, it was a very moving ceremony with uh, mem many members of both communities, Saugeen First Nation and Saugeen Shores, and beyond Saugeen Shores, actually, because Lori's reach uh, to communities through, um, throughout our region is uh, quite extensive. Uh, Lori is the Saugeen First Nations Advocacy Program Coordinator. Uh, we all met her because she and her husband, Jim, um, were the, um, we were lucky enough to have them um, as our spiritual, um, conduct our spiritual ceremony uh, for our inaugural um, session of council in the fall. Uh, but Lori has been a very active cultural and community leader uh, for years. And uh, as I said, one of the things that is a strength of hers is that she is very um, adept and gracious about building bridges um, between Saugeen First Nation and uh, surrounding communities. So that was a great event and uh, I was pleased to be part of it. Thank you, Councilor Davinsky. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. My two have been talked about already. But just to add to it, the police uh, barbecue, uh, which was behind the police uh, building, now there was an example of not enough parking because so many people came out to it. But they parked on the street, they parked where they could and uh, came in to visit and uh, have fun. I did indeed take uh, photos of this. And if anybody's interested, uh, they're on Facebook and they're on Twitter. So uh, you can see the pictures that were taken. It was a, a lot of fun. And uh, we had all the emergency services out there. Uh, the open house streetscape was held at uh, the Southampton Town Hall. <clears throat> and this is the one. <laughs> this is the one that's coming to council. And hopefully, third time is a charm because it did go well. Um, we were planning to be open from 10 a.m. to noon. And of course we were humming and hawing because all the garage sales and everything else, people showed up at 9.30 and uh, kept coming in until 12 noon. Over 100 people had something to say. We had comment cards filled out. And I even, I asked all the negative people to fill out a card. It's the only way we're going to learn. And they were happy to hear that. So uh, they, have, um, they have done so and will be reporting back. Thanks to the uh, members of the Southampton BIA that uh, set this up. I've told you before uh, as a council that they are a dynamic group and they mean business. And this is an excellent example of it. We'll see you sometime in June with a report. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Okay, we'll be seeing you before then, but Councillor Stack, nothing tonight, Councillor helping. Thank you, Mayor, and through you. Uh, just a shout out to all the people that were helping with the wild mustard pulling and, and different events like that going on. Um, I never made it to that, but I, from that, I found out I had quite a bit of it actually in, in my yard and behind. <laughs> behind my house in the alleyway. So I, I looked after that and a shout out to the people that helped with the dune planting, the dune grass planting the last couple of weeks. And it's all these little efforts that people make small environmental efforts that can have big impacts. Shout out to them. Thank you. Okay, thank you. A couple of things for me. Uh, no, oh, Justin, sorry. Councilor Duhame, sorry. Oh, yeah. Councilor Duhame. Uh, yeah, just, just want to thank the Rotary Club uh, for a really good weekend. Uh, I know I saw Councilor Mayette uh, volunteering at the Rec Laws. Uh, that was a really good time. And I think if uh, the community groups and the fundraising team put on good events like that, uh, they'll have no problem raising lots of money for the Aquatic Center. Yeah, you bet. And uh, I got to say, I had the chance to uh, talk to the Rec Laws before that event. And uh, 
it, it, they are very keen on performing here as many times as they can in the future. So I think that uh, if you like the rec laws, uh, you're going to have lots of opportunities to see them in the future, hopefully through, uh, well, I know through great events uh, organized by great service clubs like that. So uh, congratulations to all of them. Two things from me, the uh, one, the reason why I couldn't make the McGregor Park thing was because I attended the senior games uh, luncheon. I just wanted to congratulate the uh, all the folks uh, who participated in the senior games this year and all the winners and but mostly to say thank you to the to park 55 uh, and uh, um, the organizers of uh, of all of the events that uh, park 55 does including the senior games that's a great organization town is very proud to support them and all that they do and uh, provides just a great uh, opportunity for seniors in our community to get together and, and have fun and uh, and make friends so uh, thanks to them and the second thing is i was uh, at the uh, ribbon cutting for food basics, uh, I guess a week and a half ago or so. And uh, and um, I just I just wanted to note it because I think it's a really, you know, the opening of a new grocery store uh, in a community is a pretty red letter event because if those are big facilities that serve a lot of people and that um, do more than just provide food. They, uh, they, they're community spaces, right? Where, where service clubs sell tickets and where, uh, food drives happen, like you say, where they provide jobs in our community, and um, so it's a great addition. I think that whole, um, I think that whole development looks really nice, and uh, I know lots and lots of people have been in there. So congratulations to them, uh, and it was a pleasure to participate in the ribbon cutting. So with that, um, we'll take a motion to adjourn. Moved by Stack, seconded by Davinsky. All in favor? Committee stands adjourned. We'll reconvene at ten after nine. In regular council.
All right, we better get to pulling this thing back together. It's 10 after, so let's find our seats here. Okay. We still have uh, Councillor Duhane, yeah, all right. We have missing Councillor Helpin. Okay, we're ready. All right, so we'll call to order this regular council meeting and the second item on the agenda is disclosure of pecuniary interest. Ask any member if you have one or vote one of them to declare at this time. Seeing none, of course, you can do that anytime if you need to. Uh, that moves on to additions, deletions, and amendments. And we do have one amendment to the agenda for the St. Andrew's Presbyterian Church Heritage Designation Proposal, uh, which is an attachment for item 9.1. And there is a recommendation the council receive the proposal uh, to designate the property under part four, section 29 of the Ontario Heritage Act is an amendment to item 9.1. Is there a mover and seconder for that resolution? The deputy mayor and councillor Grace. All in favor? That is carried. Okay, so then we're on to adoption of minutes. We have the regular council minutes of May 8, 2023 and the committee of the whole minutes of May 8, 2023. And there's a Resolution that council adopt the minutes of the regular council meeting of May 8, 2023 and note and file the minutes of the committee of the whole meeting of May 8, 2023 as presented is remover and seconder moved by Davinsky, seconded by Stack. Questions or comments of those minutes? Seeing none, all in favor? Carried. Okay, now we are moving past public meetings and on to a close to public session. And I have a resolution that council move into a close to public session in accordance with the Municipal Act 2001, Section 2392, as follows. E, litigation or potential litigation, including matters before administrative tribunals affecting the municipality or local board. Uh, F, advice that is subject to solicitor client privilege, including communications necessary for that purpose. And K, a position plan, procedure, criteria, or instruction to be applied to any negotiations carried on or to be carried on by or on behalf of the municipality or local board. Is the remover and seconder? Moved by Stack, seconded by Grace. All in favor? That's carried. Council will now move into closed, se closed public session and uh, we'll go to the other. Zoom link for that purpose.
obligations relative to a shared services memorandum of understanding agreement for the Saugeen Shores Police Service. And we gave direction to staff on litigation or potential litigation and advice and communication that are subject to solicitor client privilege relative to a legal matter. All right. I don't think so. We already did. Council did it. So it's done. All right. So we'll move on then to. Are we off mute now? Okay. Hello, everybody. We're moving on now to um, item number eight report of the Committee of the Whole. And uh, sorry, I have a resolution here that council approved the reprofiling of the community development coordinator position to the community development officer as outlined. Two, that council received the welcoming communities action plan and the corresponding report for information. Three, the council received the capital project close carry forward report for 2022 for information. The council transferred $590,000 from the surplus from the North Shore Trail and Miramichi Bay road trail projects, the shoreline and trail restoration project, and then council transferred $580,000 from capital surpluses to fund the Louis Street to Godrich to Wellington Street project budget shortfall. <clears throat> and the council received the 2022 Southampton Landfill Monitoring Report and Waste Diversion Summary Report for information. And this is a mover and seconder. Moved by Dubinsky, seconded by the Vice Deputy Mayor. Uh, any questions or comments? Seeing none, all in favor. That's carried. All right, so now we will move on to item number two. And I have a resolution that council support the County of Bruce's Pathways to Decarbonization Environmental Registry of Ontario response letter, and that a copy of this resolution be sent to the Ministry of Energy and MPP Lisa Thompson. Is there a mover and seconder? Moved by Councilor Mayant, seconded by Councilor Helpin. Questions or comments? Uh, yeah, Councillor Stack. I um, I recuse myself from this. I just don't. You're myself. declaring a pecuniary interest. Yeah. So. And what state the nature, please? Um, just that. I can't remember, I'm trying to remember what my pecuniary interest was. I have a. There's an indirect pecuniary interest with, with my employer. Okay. Any other comments on this one, Mr. Mayor? Yeah. Yeah, I have an interest as well, same as uh, Councillor Stack as the employer. I just saw in that report that we were removed from the May 8th one, so. Yep, okay. So, uh, Councillors uh, Stack and Jim declare pecuniary interest. So, if there's no further questions or comments, then we'll ask all in favor. That's carried. I tried to do it quick so you couldn't get too far away. Okay, so now we'll go on to item, let me see here, sorry, item number three, and I have a resolution that the resolution from the Regional Municipality of Waterloo concerning removing the requirement for street name, number, and postal code to be listed on publicly available forums be endorsed by the Town of Saugeen Shores, and that a copy of this resolution be sent to MPP Lisa Thompson, the Association of Municipalities of Ontario, Association of Municipal Managers, Clerks and Treasurers of Ontario, the Ontario Public School Boards Association, and the Ontario Catholic School Trustees Association. Is there a mover and seconder, the Deputy Mayor and Councillor Grace? Questions or comments? Seeing none, all in favor? That is carried. Okay, so now we're on to reports of municipal officers and committees. And uh, the first is proposed heritage designation for St. Andrew's Presbyterian Church. There is a resolution the council adopt a bylaw to authorize a one year lease agreement with 2402918 Ontario Incorporated, care of Robert Fawcett. Oh, sorry, that's the wrong one. Oh, I don't have it. Thank you. All right, I'll just read it off here. Sorry. The count that staff be directed to proceed with the designation of St. Andrew's Presbyterian Church, 47 Albert Street North, Southampton, in accordance with the Ontario Heritage Act. Is a mover and seconder. Moved by Grace, seconded by the Vice Deputy Mayor. Any questions or comments on the resolution? Councillor Grace. Just very quickly, um, I wanted Council to know that um, the support of the Municipal Heritage Committee for this was unanimous. Um, and you saw the uh, quality, fine quality of the, of the presentation. And I want to thank Don for, or the clerk, uh, for uh, your work, not just preparing a report, but there's going to be a lot of work afterwards to follow this through. So thank you. Very good. Any further questions or comments? 
Seeing none, then all in favor. That's carried. I just signed the wrong one. Hopefully you guys approve this next thing because it's a rubric. All right. There's a resolution here, then item number two, which is uh, that council adopt a bylaw to authorize a one-year lease agreement with 2402918 Ontario Incorporated, care of Robert Fawcett, Social Athletics of Soggy and Shores for beach volleyball at the Port Elgin, Maine Beach. Is the remover and seconder moved by Stack, seconded by Vice Deputy Mayor. Any questions or comments? Seeing none, all in favor. That's carried. All right. Now we're on to item number three, staff report on the part-time operator four for the airport grounds. There's a resolution that council approved the creation of a part-time operator four parks and facilities attendant within community services and operations department for $17,000 to be funded from the existing airport operating grant. Is there a mover and seconder? Moved by Councilor Stacks, seconded by Councilor Grease. Questions or comments? Vice Deputy Mayor. Just to clarify through you to the Director of Community Services, um... Right, is it, is it that seventeen thousand you figure will cover? I mean, transferring that position from airport on into your budget, uh, will it cover? Is it in and out basically? Will it cover all the costs? Uh, thank you for the question, and through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, yes, that will be covered through the um, operating grant that the municipality provides the airport. Hundred percent covered. Correct. Any further comments? Seeing none, then all in favor. That is carried. Okay, and then we're on to a uh, final one, staff report on the Sogging Shores Police Services Network video recorder, and I have a resolution that council approve the use of the future capital reserve for the purchase of a new network video recorder for the Sogging Shores Police Service to a maximum of $60,000. Remover and seconder. Moved by the Deputy Mayor, seconded by Walter Davinsky. Questions or comments? Kind of the vice deputy mayor. Um, I'm just wondering, rather than being funded through the future capital reserve, I'm just and Jim, I just it's my understanding that the police capital building reserve um, is about forty thousand dollars in that reserve, and then the police reserve is about twenty two thousand dollars, Jim. So sixty two thousand. Would that be a good use? Um, you know, rather than taking for future capital reserve, be a good use to, you know, to deplete those reserves to pay for that sixty thousand dollars expense. I mean, paid for by the taxpayer. I mean, maybe the six one half dozen another. But I, I, I wonder why we wouldn't draw down reserves from police for a police expense. So that I guess that's my question. Thank you for the question, and uh, through the mayor to you and and the rest of the council. Uh, perhaps I'll start by giving a little bit of background um, as it relates to uh, reserve policy. And it was mentioned earlier, uh, we're working on a uh, update to the reserve policy. Included with that will be recommendations for handling of various reserve accounts, which would also include the police building reserve um, as being a candidate potentially for consolidation um, with, with, within um, other police reserves that exist. Additionally, we'll be coming forward at the same time with a, um, a report in around the same time with a report from our auditors with the year end statements um, with the finalization of surpluses from 2022 and uh, the likely result of that, including the surplus from the police operating budget from 2022, will result in an increase in the future capital reserve. Um, from what was the uh, previously um, ending balance in 2022 because of the result of the surplus. Um, part of that reserve policy will also then include a, um, um, a statement around uh, outside boards, which obviously the police service board would be one of those, um, and, the police and the police services as, uh, as well. Um, and that we would be putting in a clause um, for council consideration that would look at um, there's their surplus is being put into a reserve up to a cap. Um, something in the neighborhood of say a 5% cap could be placed on, on any of their surpluses so they could put money into the reserve but would be capped at 5% of their operating costs. So an example of police that would allow them a quarter million dollar reserve. When situations like this arise, they would then go to, to their 
reserve to pull out the, the funds. Um, in the case of uh, this past year, we're looking at somewhere in the neighborhood of about $180,000 surplus from the police department in 2022. Um, that, that surplus um, hasn't been finalized yet. Those funds haven't, haven't been resolved. Since it's going to be handled through the old um, reserve policy, those funds would be would not go into the res, into the police reserve, but would would rather be directed by council and would be placed into tax stabilization or future capital. So, in a sense, uh, you could say that the the police department is paying for this out of their own 2022 surplus via the funds that would be flowing through our tax stabilization reserve. However, you certainly, as council, have the have the ability to say today that um, the use of the 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 building reserve, the police building reserve of forty thousand dollars, could be appropriate use of of um, of funds for this purchase, and then with the remainder coming out of the uh, the future capital reserve. And just a follow up: uh, that forty thousand, Jim, the building reserve that was established back when we built the. Six point eight nine dollar police building. Is that when that was established? That is correct. What was that intended to uh, be placed in that reserve for? The intent would have been for any outstanding issues on the building, um, and so you could certainly say that this failure of equipment just prior to the end of its life cycle could could be an appropriate use for those funds. So that would be my recommendation. I don't know what it was. Council feels about it, but I think those two reserves is an appropriate use rather than future capital reserve. The reserves are in the police budget, just an expense from police. So I, I would I would suggest it would be good practice to, to fund it from those two reserves. Okay, Deputy Mayor. Um, respectfully, I, I I don't agree. Um, the setting up of that that reserve fund is is it within um, does it have to go back to the police services board to take money out of that reserve, or have you determined that that it is just available? And and I don't know the answer to that. The uh, police reserve fund itself, I believe, um, you would probably want to have the involvement of the police service board, but I believe with the building reserve, um, that was set up by council. Okay. Um. The police, police department has returned um, surplus for a number of years that has just gone right back into the, the, um, the um, future capital or, or the tax stabilization reserve. Um, there's, they have tapped into that over the years for things that are directly related to the structural elements over that. Um, this piece of or this this um, upgrade or this this requirement is it would have come in the budget next year anyway, um, so it's just slightly ahead. And it's it's um, there are tremendous pressures uh, potentially on any any reserve fund that the police department has um, should anything happen. So I wouldn't want to deplete um, a reserve completely down to zero when um, there are still deficiencies with that building that are getting addressed um, every six months or so. So um, this is this is very necessary equipment um, based on you know, what we read. And um, it also um, would have shown up in the budget next year as a capital investment going forward. So in my opinion, that's where it belongs, future capital. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Council Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, I would I would tend to agree. I think that the uh, the the building reserve, at least building reserve, was intended for things like the HVAC failure or a water leak or showers need redone, and that's what it's been used for traditionally is sort of uh, conventional things on the building, and I think that's what it needs to be in reserve for. If there's a a failure or a leak or some something that needs to be done and it has been accessed for that purpose this is more of a operational piece of equipment and i don't i think it's uh rightly placed in the future capital reserves uh, budget okay well i mean we can uh, 
go one of two ways. I think that, I mean, you can skin this cat several ways. I mean, just to say that the police pour, the police put $200,000 into reserves, yes, but they also increased their budget by 7.1%, right? So, and so, I mean, it's six of one, half dozen of the other. I think that the police building reserve was not created for those purposes. The police building reserve was created prior to the construction of the building to facilitate the process of designing and constructing a new police building. That's why it was created. It's orphaned money that's sitting there uh, and is um, perfectly suited for these purposes. And and the taxpayer and our reserves are contributing an awful lot on an ongoing basis to policing. And we're also going to set up a new reserve, which is going to take some surpluses and add it back there. I think it's perfect use for the for the building reserve. Um, so I won't support move taking it from capital reserve. I think it should come from the police building reserves um, because that's what we have those reserves for. So um, so my vote to this resolution will be no. Is there further questions or comments? I got a mover and seconder, so I'll ask all in favor. The resolution has moved. Moved by Huber, seconded by, by the, the money to come from where? The the that the council approved the use of the future capital reserve okay. for the purchase of the network video recorder, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So, all in favor? All opposed? That's, sorry, defeated. So, we can draw the, so we can consider another resolution then to draw, um, to draw down the, the police building reserve uh, to fund this, uh, and in addition, I think to the remainder from future capital reserve, the, the police budget won't, the police um, building reserve won't cover the whole cost. So I don't know what what, what direction would you like, Jim, to use the police uh, building reserve uh, and additional reserve? Can you turn your mic on there, Jim? That the council approve the use of the police building reserve with the balance coming from future capital reserve for the purchase of a new network video recorder for the Soggy Shores Police Service to a maximum of $60,000. Moved by the Vice Deputy Mayor, is there a seconder? Councilor Stack, questions or comments? Seeing none then, all in favor? And opposed? That's carried. Okay, so now we will move on to Okay. So we're on now to bylaws, and I have a Resolution that bylaw 44 2023 is hereby read a first, second, and third time and finally passed and sealed this 23rd day of May 2023. And that is mover and seconder by Grace, seconded by uh, my aunt. Um, questions or comments? Seeing none, then all in favor? That's carried. All right, and then we're on to item 12, which is the confirmatory bylaw. And I have a resolution that bylaw 45 2023, being a bylaw to confirm the proceedings of the Council of the Town of Sogging Shores, is hereby read a first, second, and third time and finally passed and sealed this 23rd day of May 2023. Is there a mover and seconder? Moved by Stack, seconded by Halpin. All in favor? That's carried. And finally, I have a resolution that this, rec that this regular council meeting of May 23rd, 2023, hereby adjourns at 10.23 p.m. Is there a mover and seconder? Moved by help and seconded by stack. All in favor? That is carried. Council stands adjourned. Have a good evening.